Good morning. Uh, the Senate Health Education Labor and Pensions Committee will please come to order. Today, we are having a hearing on the ongoing federal response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I will have an opening statement followed by Ranking Member Burr, and then we will introduce our witnesses. After they give their testimony, senators will each have five minutes for a round of questions. Today, we will be having one of our witnesses, Dr. Fauci, testify remotely by video following a positive COVID test. I appreciate the work of our committee staff to make it possible for us to accommodate this so that we can hear from Dr. Fauci while he isolates and recovers. While we are unable to have the hearing fully open to the public or media for in-person attendance, live video is available on our committee website at help.senate.gov. If anyone needs accommodations, including closed captioning, please reach out to the committee or the Office of Congressional Accessibility Services. Before we do get started on this hearing, there's another issue we are all extremely focused on, the formula crisis. Dr. Califf, uh, I understand flooding from the storms has forced Abbott's infant formula manufacturing facility in Sturgis offline since, uh, once again. Uh, so Ranking Member Burr and I agreed, and I would like to give you a moment before we begin to update the committee on the uh, latest with the plant, and I hope you can speak directly to the families in Washington State and across the country about what happened and how you are taking action to get them formula and making sure this doesn't worsen the crisis or delay our work to get formula back on the shelves as soon as possible. So Dr. Califf, I want to return to you for that before we begin the rest of the hearing. There we go. Thanks, Senator Murr. Murray and Senator uh, Burr for giving me a, a minute to speak about this. Um, you know, we have twice daily intensive calls about all the work streams working on the infant formula issue. And at the end of the call yesterday, I commented it was one of the first days that we hadn't had any surprises. 20 minutes later, uh, the email came across about the flood uh, in Sturgis, which has forced that facility uh, to temporarily uh, shut down. Uh, this is an unfortunate setback and a reminder that uh, natural weather events can cause unforeseen disruptions in supply chains. I had a call with the CEO uh, last night. Um, he's uh, sharing our desire to get the facility up and running again as quickly as possible. Abbott is working to assess the uh, damage today and uh, we'll be talking daily and we have our people um, in the facility to help get it up as quickly as we possibly can. Um, to your um, main question, which I know is of utmost importance, and we're all, uh, certainly all of us, are very concerned about parents uh, trying to get a formula for their infants. I do want to reassure parents and caregivers that the all-the-government work to increase supply means we'll have more than enough product to meet current demand, and FDA is committed to working closely with Abbott so that Sturgis can restart producing safe and quality formula products quickly. Thanks to the collaboration of all of the um, um, players in the market, we now for the first time are getting production numbers from them about um, how much formula each company is producing, including Abbott, which has revved up its other plants and is currently uh, meeting the supply um, production quotas that they were using before the shutdown. All the other manufacturers have increased their production, and of course we have Fly Formula in full swing now. So I have good numbers to indicate there will be adequate supply. Um, we had hoped to uh, have a super supply so that we get the shelves completely restocked. The estimate is um, perhaps two weeks, but it's too early to give an exact estimate of what the delay will be in the Sturgis plant. Well, thank you, Dr. Califf. I assure you that this committee and all Americans will be following this very closely. We want to be kept updated and apprised as closely as possible as you learn the facts and make sure that um, parents across the, this country are getting what they need. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, we will turn to the hearing at hand. Uh, and let me just begin by saying that we have made a lot of progress in the fight against this pandemic. It is much easier to get tests. Schools have safely returned to in-person learning. Businesses have reopened. There are new life-saving treatments for people with COVID and multiple safe, effective vaccines. 
and there is encouraging news to suggest vaccines for kids under age five will be available soon, something I know that parents across my state and the country are eagerly awaiting. Across the country, we have gotten over half a billion shots in arms. Three in four people have gotten their first COVID vaccination. Two thirds of people are fully vaccinated. This is really remarkable progress, but we have to remember the hardships of this pandemic, especially the early days, and the hard work it took us to get to where we are today. COVID-19 has killed over a million people in our country. That is an unthinkable loss. It closed businesses, shifted schools online, and as we all know, a lot more. We cannot afford to get caught off guard by this virus again. We cannot afford to go back. That's why I'm shocked. I still have to remind my colleagues the progress we have made so far was not guaranteed. It was accomplished through congressional action and through robust investments. And what happens next is not a given either. It is up to us to stay the course in our support and investments if we're going to protect our families and communities from whatever this pandemic throws at us next. That's why passing emergency funding to continue our response has to be a top priority for every single one of us. Because make no mistake, it's not a matter of if this pandemic will throw us another curveball. It is a matter of when. That's why emergency COVID funding is not something that would be nice to have. It's something that we desperately need. Because if we wait until there's already a new dangerous variant, or until we are in the middle of a fall or winter surge, which some experts are predicting will happen, we will have missed the boat. We need to be doing everything we can now to get ready. That's what people back in Washington State and across the country are depending on Congress to do. And it's why I want to hear more about, what's what I want to hear more about from all of our witnesses today. What do we do, need to do right now so we're not caught off guard later? Because one thing we already know is when it comes to pandemics, when it comes to public health, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we need to be investing in prevention now. We need to be ordering the treatments we need for a fall surge. Now, especially when it can take six months, by the way, to manufacture Paxlovid. We need to be ordering the vaccines we will need now. We need to be combating misinformation that is already far too pre prevalent and damaging now. We need to be getting the testing, PPE we will need lined up, especially for our schools and healthcare facilities now. And let's be clear, we can't just keep buying the same tests, treatments, and vaccines, especially when this virus is getting more effective at evading them. As important as they continue to be to our progress, we cannot continue acting as though the vaccines and therapeutics we have now are the end all be all. We've got to support the next generation keep several irons in the fire, and avoid getting caught in a situation where our tools or options are limited to just a few companies. After all, we know this virus will not play favorites. That's why it's critical we invest in the research and development of the next generation tests, vaccines, and treatments that are more effective or easier to store or transport or administer. Because once there is a variant that cannot be detected by our current tests, that does not respond to current treatments, that is not stopped by our current vaccines, we've got to be ready. And the research and development of these critical tools can take time. And let's be clear, none of that would be unprecedented. In fact, it is to be expected. When it happens, time is of the essence to save lives, and families are counting on us right now to act like it. The reality is we are already running out of resources to prepare for the fall, and we are running out of time to fix that. Democrats have been hammering this home for months. We've been yelling from the rooftops, warning what's at risk if we do not get this done. I am at a loss as to how I can possibly make the urgency of this moment more clear to all of our Republican colleagues. The fact that the administration has had to resort to allocating resources from our long-term needs to keep our short-term response afloat, that is not a solution, that's a stopgap. And it should be a clear sign of how urgent it is that Congress take action. We need to continue to support a full, robust response. This is simply too important to scramble again on short notice 
or shortchange our communities. And in addition to more resources, we need to make sure we are getting our communities the guidance and technical assistance they need to get ready as well. This is especially critical for our schools. School officials and educators want to do everything they can to keep our students safely in the classroom. In fact, everyone wants that. But we can't leave them waiting until back to school season if we're going to make it happen. Schools back in my state want to know what they can be doing right now to get ready for the next school year. How can they best position themselves to make sure if we have a fall surge, they have the resources and a plan in place that protects students and educators and keeps them safely in the classroom. So I want to hear more from our witnesses about how they are working with the Department of Education to get schools the support they need. And of course, in addition to making sure we prepare for what is next in the course of this pandemic, we need to make sure we are ready for whatever public health threat we face next, period. That means making sustained annual investments in our public health system like I have proposed so we can end the cycle of crisis and complacency. It means making bold investments in pandemic preparedness. It means strengthening our federal policies and processes like Senator Burr and I are working to do in our bipartisan Prevent Pandemics Act. And I know I've said it already, but I will say it again and again, until we get this done, it means passing the emergency COVID funding we need to make sure our communities are able to continue getting back to normal, not back to the darkest days of this pandemic when we couldn't get tests, when we didn't have effective treatments, when we didn't have vaccines. After everything we've been through, it should be clear this is not the time to settle for doing too little or acting too late. I can tell you that it is clear to me, and it is certainly clear to the families I'm hearing from back in Washington State. So I'm going to keep pressing for us to get emergency funding passed as soon as possible and get our communities everything they need to keep people safe. I'm asking my Republican colleagues to please consider the cost of inaction. Consider what it means for our doctors, for our nurses, our small business owners, our high-risk families and friends, including seniors and immunocompromised people, our educators, our students, if we let COVID get the better of us, because we failed to make a modest investment right now. So I hope we can work together and find a path forward here. Senator Burr, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I welcome our guest. Tony, I hope uh, you're having a mild case. To our witnesses, thank you for uh, coming back to the Health Committee. When we were last together in January, our country was in the throes of the original Omicron surge. At that time, I asked you one basic question. What's the plan? I hope in your opening statements, or maybe when I ask this question in the question round, somebody will give me an answer. The chairman just did a fabulous job of painting Republicans as an obstacle for there not being enough emergency funding. I remind my colleagues, we spent $1.9 billion just on COVID a year ago. Where's that money gone? How's it been spent? Where is it obligated? No plan's been presented, but on multiple occasions, the chairman's been in the room when I've said, here's a condition, present us a plan. Now, in early May, this plan went out. It just tells me what you would buy if you got 10 billion and what you would buy if you got 17.5 billion, and it says confidential. Um, this isn't a plan. When is somebody gonna share with the American people the destination we're trying to get to, and how we're going to get to that destination. We're still in crisis management, and we're two and a half years into this. And I'm really sympathetic of Dr. Fauci's position because Tony, more than anybody, understands we're dealing with a virus that continues to evolve and change. But since the time we last got together, we've seen Omicron subvariants take hold. Right now, cases of BA4 and BA5 are creeping up around the country. In January, I asked you yet again how this administration was looking to other countries that have already experienced new surges so that we can prepare for, we can prepare for the impacts of new variants in the U.S. and inform our response. 
BA4 and BA5, for example, caused a new wave of infections in countries where they're dominant, like South Africa and Portugal. 22% of the cases in the United States are currently BA4 or BA5, a number that continues to increase daily. We're learning from other countries and regions that are ahead of us, like Israel and Europe. What do we need to be doing today to ensure that we're prepared for what we face in the weeks and the months to come? I've asked you repeatedly about studies out of Israel and other countries. I've been frustrated by the lack of detail about what you're learning from other countries and how it informs our COVID response. So quite frankly, I sent my staff to Israel over the Memorial Day recess. It's my understanding that we meet regularly either by phone or in person or with our Israeli counterparts. During these meetings, they share the latest COVID trends in Israel and any updated data on their vaccine clinical trials and studies. If you're getting the information regularly, why is it taking so long for us to act on it? In January, Israel became the first country to offer a fourth vaccine dose to individuals over 60 and healthcare workers that were at least four months past their first dose or their third dose. Israeli health ministers announced new data at the end of January demonstrating additional protections from a fourth vaccine dose for those 60 and over. It took CDC three months to take similar steps. I'll say it again, three months. Israel has also taken steps to appropriately target the use of limited COVID-19 countermeasures. Israel targeted its supply of oral antivirals to treat those with the greatest risk of severe illness to keep them out of the hospital and to keep them alive. Meanwhile, the Biden administration developed a new plan, test and treat, strategy to provide therapeutics to anybody who presented and infected and, and came up positive. The terms of the emergency youth authorization are, are that Pfizer drugs should be given to high risk patients, not everyone who tests positive. There's the Israeli data influence. But the way we've applied the EUA instructions from FDA is handed out to anybody who walks in and tests positive. Test positive, get an antiviral. The terms of the emergency youth authorization, I said, um, but I'll quote this. People can, this was the president, People can get tested at a pharmacy and if they're positive, receive antiviral pills on the spot at no cost. So either the president was confused about his own announcement or you're deliberately giving these pills to too many patients, violating the terms of the EUA, putting people at risk and wasting treatments and taxpayer dollars. I'm puzzled by the wide gap in our approaches when so much data is regularly being shared between health leaders in both countries. Before you say our countries are different sizes, I'll remind you that we can approve drugs and devices based on samples of just a few thousand patients. The virus is the same in Israel and in the United States, and we've seen Israel get hit by new variants every between six and eight weeks before the United States. Israel's quick and decisive actions in early December delayed the on, on, onset of Omicron wave by five weeks. They had a clear path and clear leadership. Meanwhile, we've discarded over 82 million COVID vaccine doses in the United States. And this administration assumes that at least 50% of booster doses we purchased this fall will go to waste. My God, folks. Let's figure out a different plan for inoculating these people. Why do we keep falling further behind? Why aren't we trying to do better? Why aren't we learning from our mistakes? It doesn't seem like we're striving for anything other than mediocrity. Have we given up? Let me highlight just a few of the more glaring inconsistencies. In April, CDC released data indicating nearly 60% of the Americans and about 75% of American people and 75% of children had at least one COVID-19 infection by the end of February. 
Though more recent data has not been released, I imagine the infection is, rate is even higher today, given the recent spikes in cases. We know the majority of Americans age five and over are vaccinated. So the majority of Americans have some degree of protection against the virus, yet we only removed our pre-departure testing requirements for travelers entering the United States legally this past Sunday. Many EU countries lifted their pre-entry testing requirements for fully vaccinated travelers in February and March. Canada followed suit in April. This is not an isolated example of where we lag behind because we either don't believe the data that they're providing or it doesn't fit with the narrative that we're trying to carry out. In response to a letter I wrote about my concerns with CDC termination of Title 42 order, you wrote, quote, the COVID-19 risk for U.S. communities is greatly reduced for most people compared to earlier in the pandemic, end quote. So why are we still in an urgent state of emergency and taking months to remove restrictions that other countries have been removing since February? American people are fed up with confusing messaging and inconsistent response. So let me ask again, what's the plan? More than two years ago, uh, two years into the, this pandemic, the American people are going back to work in person, attending weddings, events, traveling for work and leisure, and government still allows its employees, even at the FDA, CDC, and within a HHS platform to work remotely. Individuals who are at higher risk of severe illness or those who live in communities with higher levels of circulating virus know the precautions they need to take to keep themselves and their family safe. And if they get sick, we have tests and treatments to help them recover. We know more now than we did two years ago. We have more tools today to save more lives. Do we know everything? No. It's past time to think about the future. I've asked you an over and over and over again for a plan. The plan for gaining back the trust of the American people and moving our country forward. Six months later, I still haven't received an adequate response to what plan the plan actually is. Since I'm having trouble getting a response to my initial question, let me end with asking each of you a slightly different one. Every good plan is crafted around an intended outcome. So I hope all of you can answer this. What's your end game? Maybe I'll respond differently to the chairman uh, about the attacks that we're standing, Republicans, in the way of funding emergency money. But CDC says it's not an emergency anymore. That's why they're in Title 42. Um, I can go through a litany of things that suggest this has transformed to somewhere. Um, we're in a period that there needs to be an accountability for how we spent the $1.9 trillion devoted to COVID. I think any country in the world laughs at the way we're spending our money relative to this crisis and this virus. So I'll continue to ask you for a plan until we get one, and I'll continue to be a roadblock for those who believe that we can blindly just appropriate emergency money, borrow it from the Chinese, and spend it on something that none of us have a clue as to what the plan is. I thank the chair. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Burr. I will now introduce today's witnesses. Dr. Rochelle Walensky is the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the administrator of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Dr. Anthony Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the chief medical advisor on President Biden's COVID-19 response team. Dr. Fauci, we do appreciate you joining us virtually uh, following your positive COVID test, and of course, we all do wish you a very speedy recovery. Dr. Robert Califf is the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, and Don O'Connell is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Director Walensky, uh, Director Fauci, Commissioner Califf, Assistant Secretary O'Connell, thank you all so much for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony. 
We will begin with Dr. Walensky. Chair Mary, Ranking Member Burr, members of the Senate Health Committee, I appreciate the opportunity to join you once again to provide an update on the COVID-19 pandemic and the work CDC continues to do to help Americans live safer, healthier lives. It was just over a month ago that we surpassed 1 million COVID deaths in the United States. To many, that number seemed unthinkable when the pandemic began, but it's a sobering reality that so many of us have experienced great loss over the past two years. We recently experienced another increase in COVID cases, which was accompanied by an increase in hospitalizations and deaths. Through this, we continue to see that immunity through vaccination and infection has resulted in fewer hospitalizations and deaths than from COVID surges prior to Omicron. At this time, 67% of our population live in counties at medium or high COVID community levels, twice as many as people one month ago. CDC's COVID community levels have been an important tool to empower localities and jurisdictions to decide where and when to use proven prevention strategies to limit the impact of COVID-19. Our ability to manage this virus today is in large part due to the tools we have, vaccines, tests, treatments, and masks. We continue to work hard to increase access to these important tools every day so that Americans can better protect themselves. For example, we've recently expanded the eligibility of COVID vaccine boosters for children ages five to 11. And just this week, we're coordinating with our colleagues at FDA to consider recommendations for those six months to four years to receive their first COVID shots. Since the start of this pandemic, nearly 8 million children, 11 and younger, have been diagnosed with COVID. Over, over 50,000 have been hospitalized and over 600 have died. I know that many parents are anxiously waiting to vaccinate their children under five, and we are committed to carefully reviewing the data so that these vaccines are recommended only if they have both safe and effective profiles. As I look towards the future of CDC's COVID response, thanks to congressional support, CDC will be awarding health workers to face current and emerging public health threats. While this is an exciting opportunity to help address a long-standing gap, I'm deeply concerned that a lack of additional funding for other response activities will end or substantially scale back critical COVID response work. Congress and the American people expect that CDC will continue nationwide studies to evaluate immunity, to conduct long-term surveillance on COVID, to, including on post-COVID conditions, and to support future vaccination efforts both globally and domestically. We need additional funding to do this work. As we continue to support our COVID-19 response efforts, we must not forget that this will not be our last public health challenge, and we continue to face future public health threats. Just this past month, we've seen outbreaks of monkeypox in non-endemic countries, including here in the United States. CDC's swift action has supported testing and case identification. However, as threats like monkeypox emerge, we run the risk of again being constrained by incomplete data from our fragmented public health data reporting system. We need to work together to support new authority for CDC to receive timely, standardized, and uniform data. This pandemic has highlighted the need for disease agnostic investments to address the long-standing vulnerabilities in our public health system. The fiscal year 23 budget request proposes $28 billion for CDC over five years to enhance early warning and situational awareness capabilities, to support workforce programs, to bolster public health infrastructure, to invest in data modernization, and to prioritize global health security initiatives. The budget also proposes a vaccine for adults program modeled on the successful vaccine for children's program. This program highlights my and the administration's commitment to health equity by creating a mandatory funding stream through which uninsured adults would have increased access to vaccinations, sustaining the infrastructure built during the COVID pandemic. Congressional support for these initiatives, accompanied by additional authorities to collect and coordinate public health data, will strengthen our nation's ability to prepare for and respond to emerging public health and biosecurity threats. I'm committed to working with each and every one of you to find common ground to support public health and make meaningful strides towards achieving health security for all Americans, both now and into the future. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Fauci. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Burr, members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss with you 
the role of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in conducting and supporting research addressing our nation's response to COVID-19. In a prior hearing before this committee on January the 11th, I discussed the research efforts by NIH to address the Omicron variant. This variant has evolved with multiple mutations that are associated with an increased efficiency of transmission and immune evasion. Fortunately, our current vaccines have maintained their effectiveness in preventing severe COVID-19. However, individuals who have received only their primary vaccine regimen have a greater likelihood of getting infected with the Omicron variant than with previous variants. And so importantly, booster shots have been shown to significantly reconstitute and enhance the level of antibodies that neutralize the Omicron variant and its sublineages. Since I last appeared before this committee, NIAID launched the COVAIL trial to learn whether various fourth dose booster regimens can further increase the breadth and the durability of immune responses in adults who have received their primary COVID-19 vaccination plus a single boost. We remain concerned that most children eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine have not been vaccinated. NIAID and Barter have collaborated with Moderna on the KitCov study to evaluate the safety and efficacy of Moderna's mRNA vaccine in children, including those under five years of age. Initial results from the KitCov study have helped inform the FDA's VRPAC advisory committee in their recommendations to the FDA concerning potential emergency use authorization for their vaccine in this population, and also ultimately to inform the CDC in their recommendations. Looking ahead to the anticipated emergence of new variants, the importance of developing the next generation of coronavirus vaccines is paramount. I refer to a vaccine that would be effective against all SARS-CoV-2 variants and ultimately one effective against all coronaviruses. NIAID has issued new awards to fund research focused on designing and developing such pan-coronavirus vaccines. NIAID and other involved entities also have made significant progress in the development of COVID-19 therapeutics. We now have a toolkit of therapeutics that remain effective against the Omicron variant and its currently circulating sublineage variants. These therapeutics include the oral antiviral drugs Paxlovid and Malnupiravir, as well as Remdesivir and the monoclonal antibody Beptilavimab, all of which have NIAID fingerprints on their development. In addition, NIAID is funding nine antiviral drug discovery centers for pathogens of pandemic concern that will develop oral antivirals for use in outpatient settings that target SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses with high potential to <laughs> cause the pandemic. We know that even after people recover from an infection with SARS-CoV-2, some will experience ongoing symptoms or other negative health effects after the acute infection has resolved. The NIH Recover Initiative complements ongoing NIAID studies to better understand the various post-acute manifestations of COVID-19. The RECOVER team is building a diverse national study cohort and supporting large-scale studies on the long-term effects of COVID-19. NIAID also is participating in caring for children with COVID, a trans-NIH effort to better understand the rare but extremely serious multi-system inflammatory syndrome, or MISC, that has been associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection in children and adolescents. Finally, NIAID will play an important role in the all-of-government plan for pandemic preparedness that aims to develop and implement a range of countermeasures against important prototype pathogen families of viruses that threaten the health and safety, not only of our nation, but the entire world. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer your questions following the presentations of my colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Dr. Califf. 
Chair Murray, Ranking Member Burr, and members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity to provide an update on FDA's ongoing work related to the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> FDA's thousands of employees remain steadfast in their commitment to fighting the pandemic, and we will continue to use every tool in our toolbox to arm ourselves with the best available diagnostics, life-saving therapeutics, and vaccines to fight the virus. Since our last update to this committee, FDA has approved a second vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, for individuals 18 and older, authorized a second booster dose of Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines for older people and certain immunocompromised individuals, and expanded eligibility for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine booster dose to children 5 to 11 years. We have also held advisory committee meetings this month related to the emergency use requests for the Novavax vaccine to prevent COVID-19 in individuals 18 years of age and older, for the Moderna vaccine for six years through 17 years of age, and just yesterday, for both the Moderna vaccine for six months through five years of age and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for six months through four years of age. In each case, without a dissenting vote, the committee agreed that the benefits outweigh the risks in the intended population. The agency is working diligently to complete our evaluation of the data for these submissions, including taking into account the advisory committee's recommendations, and we'll make a determination as quickly as we can. Authorizing a vaccine with adequate evidence for safety and efficacy for young children, in particular, remains a top agency priority. In addition, on June 28, the advisory committee will meet to discuss whether the strain composition of COVID-19 vaccines should be modified and which strains should be selected for the fall. We also continue to employ our EUA authorities to facilitate availability of tests, including at-home diagnostic tests, molecular, antigen, and serology tests. For treatments, as of May 31st, 2022, there are more than 700 drug development programs in the planning stages, and we have reviewed more than 460 trials for potential COVID-19 therapies. These include antivirals, immunomodulators, neutralizing antibodies, and combinations of these products, as well as cell and gene therapies. Regarding treatments for COVID-19, in February, FDA issued an EUA for beptilovimab for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in certain adults and pediatric patients, and in May approved aluminate baricitinib for treatment of COVID-19 in certain hospitalized adults. I'm a cardiologist. I'm accustomed to dealing directly with life and death. The best way to avoid dying or getting critically ill requiring hospitalization from COVID is to be up to date on your vaccinations. And if you then get infected and you're high risk, these new therapies offer additional protection against being dead or in the hospital. Just like heart attack patients who die without proper treatment to open the blocked artery, a person who dies of COVID without appropriate vaccination and treatment is an unnecessary loss of life. I've evaluated therapies for four decades now, and this is among the most robust data for saving lives that I've ever seen. It's not too late to get vaccinated or boosted so that you're up to date with your vaccinations. More than two years into this pandemic, we continue to work around the clock while not compromising our scientific standards. We also continue to monitor changes in the pandemic. Using our finite resources, we're supporting the expansion of the country's arsenal of safe and effective vaccines and treatments and accurate and reliable tests that will protect the American people as the virus continues to evolve. We continue to face challenges, particularly in the area of access to the data we need to make the best decisions. It's imperative that we have access to complete data in order to prevent shortages, track adverse events, and evaluate the safety and effectiveness of medical products that are critical to our response efforts, particularly since the virus continues to change, leading to ongoing questions about the pertinence of initial data that leads to the EUA. We're constantly working to get the data we need together with our partners in a very collaborative ecosystem, but the fragmentation of our health system makes it difficult for us to access complete data needed to monitor key parameters. We can do better. I hope we can continue to work together to address issues like these 
and learn from the COVID-19 response efforts. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Assistant Secretary O'Connell. Chair Murray, Ranking Member Burr, and distinguished members of the committee, it is an honor to testify before you today on efforts within ASPR to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. The administration continues to apply a whole of government approach to protecting Americans from COVID-19, and ASPR leads the operational response with responsibilities for procuring and distributing many of the tools needed to fight the virus, including vaccines, therapeutics, and tests. Thanks to the collaboration across HHS and with partners at DOD and with private industry, ASPR has delivered more than 750 million doses of safe, effective, and free vaccine to 90,000 vaccination sites around the country, contributing to 221 million people being fully vaccinated. We continue to allocate vaccine and boosters to sites nationwide. We are now preparing to support the distribution of vaccine for kids under five, should FDA authorize and CDC recommend a vaccine for that population. We have made 10 million doses available to states, pharmacies, community health centers, and federal entities to order initially, with more doses becoming available soon after. Uh, we are also preparing for the distribution of Novavax's protein-based vaccine, should it receive authorization and recommendation. This would provide those who are allergic to mRNA vaccine or prefer a non-mRNA vaccine the option to get vaccinated. While vaccines remain the best way to prevent severe illness caused by COVID-19, we continue to have therapeutics available to prevent and treat infection. Today, Asper allocates four different products, two oral antivirals, one monoclonal antibody for treatment, and one monoclonal antibody for pre-exposure prophylaxis for immunocompromised people. We remain focused on making sure that providers and patients know these products are available, that they are free and they can be found at approximately 50,000 locations nationwide wide. Testing continues to be an important part of our COVID response. We have made significant progress in increasing testing supply, availability, and affordability over the past year. In fact, we went from zero over-the-counter tests in January 2021 to approximately 300 million tests available this winter. ASPR has secured more than 900 million at-home tests for distribution for free to American households through the U.S. Postal Service. So far, we've delivered nearly 500 million tests to more than 70 million American households via the covidtest.gov program, and we have just opened our third round of ordering. Since May 2021, ASPR has also shipped over 149 rapid antigen tests and 8.1 million point-of-care PCR tests to our most vulnerable populations, including nursing homes, federally qualified health centers, and long-term care facilities. In addition to the purchase and distribution of these tests, ASPR continues to work with manufacturers, companies, and laboratories to identify and proactively address any supply issues. ASPR continues to stock the Strategic National Stockpile, or SNS, inventory to at or above pre-COVID-19 levels to ensure that we are prepared for the next wave of cases. We are doing so to the extent possible with domestically manufactured supplies and equipment. The SNS currently has 42 times the number of N95 respirators, 8.5 times the number of surgical and procedural face masks, 12.5 times the number of gowns and coveralls, 272 times the number of gloves and 10 times the number of ventilators than we had prior to the start of the pandemic. While COVID has been anything but predictable, today we are in a much better position to respond than we were a year ago. A big reason is because Congress on a bipartisan basis provided the resources needed to make sure America Americans had these free and widely available tools to protect themselves. Unfortunately, without additional funding, our ability to prepare for whatever comes next is severely limited. Last week, the administration notified Congress that in the absence of new funding, it was repurposing $10.2 billion in COVID supplemental funding, taking it from critical programs in order to secure more of our most important tools, life-saving vaccines and therapeutics. The difficult decision was made to divert funds from our testing program and the SNS at a time when both programs are finally better positioned and better prepared than they have been at any point in this response, and they require funding to be maintained and strengthened in order to stay that way. Without additional supplemental funds, we are at a point where each spending decision comes with the difficult trade-offs trade that none of us want to make. 
I look forward to working with you on these difficult funding decisions as we continue to respond to COVID and prepare the country for whatever this virus might bring next. Thank you for your support, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you to all of our witnesses this morning. We will now begin a round of five-minute questions. I ask my colleagues, please keep track of your clock and stay within the five minutes. We are quickly running out of resources to prepare for another COVID surge. I'm talking about vaccines that can keep us safe from the new COVID variants, more accurate tests, new treatments that work against new variants to prevent serious illness and death. Develop Developing those products is essential, but it takes funding and it takes time. If we don't provide more funding now, the vaccines and treatments we need in the fall may not be available. I don't want to be in a situation again where our schools and child care centers are closed or our hospitals and health care workers are overwhelmed, and I want to make sure everyone who wants a vaccine gets one in the fall. So I want to ask each one of you individually this morning, why are additional investments in our COVID response needed now? And how will our ability to prepare for and respond to COVID change if we do not provide additional support? Dr. Lewinsky, I will begin with you. Thank you, Chair Murray. Um, we have numerous ongoing studies that will not be able to continue, studies that I believe the American people are interested in and need to see, including uh, two nationwide zero prevalence studies that need to end in December 2022. These include the national burden and incidence of infections, immunity, and correlates of protection. We are unable to continue our long-term surveillance, and that includes comprehensive monitoring of post-COVID conditions. We will be unable to continue our mother-to-baby surveillance, and that includes mother with COVID, we've learned a lot about how the impact, they impact on their babies, as well as the vaccine impact of pregnant women and on their babies. But we won't be able to do those studies for things like Paxlovid and other therapeutics, including monoclonal antibodies. And then finally, CDC will not be able to continue its global um, vaccine efforts, and in the future, its domestic vaccine efforts uh, for support as well. Thank you. Dr. Califf? To me, the most important thing that will happen is people will die or be hospitalized or experience long COVID for days to months to maybe a lifetime unnecessarily if they don't have access to the latest vaccines and antivirals. Within the FDA, we have to keep track of all this and adapt to this rapidly changing virus in the environment that it's in. And I want to add one more component we haven't talked about, the supply chains of all of this. I've learned a lot about the food supply chain in the last few months, and it's not just infant formula. We have multiple areas of agricultural supply that are tenuous if workers get sick uh, and can't tend. We all remember the early days of the pandemic in that regard. Uh, Ms. O'Connell. Thank you. Without additional funds, we've already seen that we're going to be limited in our ability to maintain domestic uh, manufacturing of tests. We've been able to support that over the last several months and keep it ramped up uh, to meet the demand the American people have had for over-the-counter tests. We're now having to divert funds away from that. We're also not going to be able to expand our domestic manufacturing of mRNA vaccines. This was one of the things that we uh, think is important for our current response and future preparedness. In addition, uh, the strategic national stockpile is not going to be able to purchase domestically manufactured surgical gowns, as we anticipated being able to do, and we'll struggle to be able to maintain the current PPA, PPE levels uh, that I just walked through. Uh, we also are unable to invest in the research and advanced research and development for next generation vaccines and therapeutics. Dr. Fauci. Yes, Madam Chair. As you know, the role of the NIH is to do the basic clinical and translational research to develop the countermeasures that we have so successfully been part of that process to get us the vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. As you mentioned in your opening statement, this virus is changing and we need to keep up with it. In order to do that, we've got to do better with new vaccine platforms, such as nanoparticle vaccines. We cannot proceed with that unless we get additional funding. Importantly, we need to both prevent infection and transmission. We know that we cannot do that unless we get a highly effective mucosal or intranasal vaccine. We have a number of projects that will not be able to be funded unless we do get new resources to continue these funding. These are challenges that we have that I believe will be letting the American people down if we do not use our scientific capabilities to meet the next challenge of this ever-changing virus. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, you know, COVID-19 vaccines have done an incredible job keeping people get, from getting se severely ill, and COVID treatments have, as we know, saved thousands of lives. However, we only have a limited number of treatments and vaccines, and they are produced by a small number of companies. I think everyone in this room is worried we are over-reliant on current products and not doing enough to get ahead with the next generation vaccines or treatments or tests, and I'm worried we're not investing in that research and development of products that we will need this winter. In our conversations, Dr. Fauci, Ms. O'Connell, it is clear that NIH and ASPR do not have sufficient resources to invest in the, that necessary research and development work. Dr. Fauci, you alluded to this a little bit, but talk about what you are doing to ensure this next generation research is the top priority for NIH, and what can NIH do to bring these products further along in the process with its existing funding? Thank you, Madam Chair. Two examples of what we're doing with regard to therapeutics is the antiviral program for pandemics, where we're using both development and discovery very similar to the paradigm that was used for the highly successful development and discovery of drugs for HIV, namely the antiviral drugs. We will absolutely need more resources to get that done effectively. In addition, we have just awarded nine uh, centers that are centers for, it's called AVID, the Antiviral D Drug Discovery Centers. We have very good investigators throughout this country. We could fund many more, and that would hasten the capability that we have of developing new drugs. How we can continue to further that is to do what we've been doing all along, is to partner with our industrial partners to be able to do the fundamental basic concept development, and then together with Barter, which, which we have been very successful with in that partnership, to continue to develop these new drugs as well as diagnostics. Thank you. Senator Burr. We'll turn to each of you for a yes or no answer. You've just described programs that you said would be devastating if emergency funding was not made available. Did the administration request funding in their 23 budget for the programs you just listed? Dr. Walensky? I, I would have to get back with you in detail. Dr. Califf? I'm certain that parts of it were requested, but not the full amount. Ms. O'Connell? And we're beginning the process of figuring out how to absorb these costs into our annual budgets moving forward. Uh, I, I asked, did they make a request? You came with very specific things that are not, are, are going to be disastrous if emergency spending is not. Now, we're, 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 we're doing the 23 budget. The budget request has come in from the administration. Did they request these things? It's been over a year since we've received COVID-specific funding. A lot has fact, changed. The, the administration just took money from the strategic national stockpile. They didn't ask for more, they took it. They asked for less. Uh, Dr. Fauci, are all the things that you just listed, are they in the 23 administration request of Congress to fund? Some of them are, Senator, but not all of them. Because at, at the time that we put in that request, the opportunities to do some of the things we've done were not absolutely apparent to us. So the direct answer to your question is not all of it is in the request. Yeah. It, it, are you beginning to see the pattern as to why a plan is important? Now, this has been a well-orchestrated event up till this point. Um, it's done you damage. It really has. Um, Dr. Califf, we hit the point in public health response where there's a commercial market for COVID vaccines, treatments, and diagnostics. Yet FDA is still limiting who can purchase vaccines and treatments under the EUA. Limit, uh, nothing in the law requires that the purchaser of an authorized or EUA vaccine or treatment must be government. Does FDA have a plan to allow states or healthcare providers, including payers, to purchase vaccines and treatments to help put purchasing decisions back in the hands of Americans rather than government? Senator Burr, um, each of our major product areas, drugs, devices, biologics, is working with the industry to be Transitioning, a number of them already have transitioned to full. You, you understand what I what I read in the in the in the statement was you actually write into the EUA only government can purchase these. That's correct. And the law does not restrict 
anybody else from purchasing under an EUA. It's the limitation you put in the EUA, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, let's talk about EUAs a little bit further. The EUA on antivirals. Did I misstate anything that the antiviral EUA states that it should only be prescribed to individuals that are at risk? Right. Pfizer did a robust clinical trial in, uh, that included people at risk, at higher risk by certain factors. We looked at the data. The data were compelling. That was the basis for the EUA. And the, and the EUA says to be prescribed to individuals at risk? At those at high risk, yes. So does test and treat violate the restrictions in the EUA if individuals who show up are not at risk, test positive, or given an antiviral? My interpretation of test and treat is um, it, it's still uh, prescribing Paxlovid is still within the EUA, and so only those who meet the risk criteria would be prescribed it. So anybody that does not re the, reach the risk criteria would be in violation of the EUA? Um, I think prescribing, as you know, is a complicated area of medical practice. So when you say in violation, I'm not sure what the legal meaning of that in the context of medical practice. But people who are low risk, like a 25-year-old with COVID and no comorbidities, would not be expected to get benefit, and so it wouldn't make sense to prescribe it. Was the vice president at high risk when she took the antiviral? I'm not aware of the vice president's clinical status, and as a physician, I wouldn't discuss a person's medical history. Ms. O'Connell, just... Just last week, HHS announced that it had found $10 billion in the couch. Um, out of those funds uh, previously provided for COVID responses, I was surprised and frustrated to hear that these funds were overwhelmingly repurposed from within ASPR, including the stockpile. It's my understanding that over a billion dollars will be taken from the strategic national stockpile. What are we giving up in the stockpile so that that billion dollars can be spread across the, 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 the rest of response? Thank you, Senator. Without additional funding, we've been forced to make very difficult decisions, make trade-offs that none of us want to make. Uh, and that included finding an additional billion dollars from the Strategic National Stockpile. That funding would have gone to securing the purchase of domestically manufactured surgical gowns uh, in order to meet the requirement uh, the, the Strategic National Stockpile has uh, for surgical gowns. So we're going to be short there. Uh, we also are jeopardizing our ability to maintain the PPE at the levels that we currently are. Every uh, piece of equipment we have is warehoused. Uh, the warehousing costs money. Ms. Uh, O'Connell, you're, you're the ASPR, and by statute, you're supposed to lead a pandemic. So I'm going to turn to you. Tell me what the plan is. Well, the administration put forward a plan on March 3rd with how it would spend uh, the additional funds that it was requesting. I understand, I understand how you would spend it. Tell me what the plan is to get to some end game in COVID. So our plan involves short term providing, uh, making sure all Americans have access to the critical tools needed to protect themselves. Medium term, making sure that we have access to supplies moving forward, investing in domestic manufacturing so we're not caught short footed like we were in March 2020. And then long term, this uh, research and development that we've talked about to get us to the next generation of vaccines that won't require multiple boosts, now, to get us to therapies that can be prescribed for everybody. Uh, that's you, where we need to go. If you, if you can take the outline you just presented to me and get somebody from the administration to fill in in between the action steps that are going to be taken, you might have a plan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Senator Paul. Dr. Fauci, the government recommends uh, everybody take a booster over age five. Are you aware of any studies that show reduction in hospitalization or death for children who take a booster? Right now, there's not enough data that has been accumulated, Senator Paul, to indicate that that's the case. The, I believe that the recommendation that was made was based on the assumption that if you look at the morbidity and mortality of children within each of the age groups, you know, zero so, to five, five to 11. Right. So, so, let's, so there, there are no studies, and Americans should all know this, there are no studies on children showing a reduction in hospitalization or death with taking a booster. The only studies that were permitted, the only studies that were presented were antibody studies. So they say, if we give you a booster, you make antibodies. 
Now, a lot of scientists would question whether or not that's proof of efficacy of a vaccine. If I give you 10, or if I give a patient 10 mRNA vaccines and they make protein each time or they make antibody each time, is that proof that we should give 10 boosters, Dr. Fauci? Uh, no, that, I think that is somewhat of an absurd exaggeration. Senator well, that Paul. is the proof that you use. Your committees use that. That's the only proof you have to tell children to take a booster is that they make antibodies. So it's right. not an there absurdity. Are, You're already no. at like five boosters for people. You've had, you know, two or three boosters. It's like, where is the proof? Now, I think there is yeah. probably some indication for older folks that have some risk factors. For younger folks, there's not. But here's the yeah. other thing. There are some risk factors for, for the vaccine. So the risk of myocarditis with a second dose for adolescent boys 12 to 24 is about 80 in a million. This is both from the CDC and from the Israeli study. It's also in the VAR study, remarkably similar, four boys, much higher from boys than girls and much higher than the background. The background's about two per million. So there is risk and there are risks. And you're telling everybody in America just blindly go out there because we made antibodies. So it is not an absurd corollary to say if you have 10. In fact, you probably make antibodies if you get 100 boosters. All right? That's not science. That's conjecture. And we should not be making public policy on it. So, Senator Paul, if I might respond to that, uh, we just heard in his opening statement, uh, Ranking Member Burr talk about his staff who went to Israel. And if you look at the data from Israel, the boosts, both the third shot boost and the fourth shot boost, was associated with a clear cut clinical effect, mostly in elderly people, but also as they gathered more data, even in people in the 40s and the 50s. So there is clinical data. But, but not in children. Well, uh, well, see, again, here's we, the thing is you're not willing to be honest with the American people. So, for example, 75 percent of kids have had the disease. Why is the CDC not including this in the data? You can ask right. the question. You can do laboratory tests to find out who's had it and who hasn't had the disease. What is the incidence of hospitalization and death for children who have been infected with COVID subsequently going to the hospital or dying? What, what, are, what is the possibility if your kid has had COVID, which is 75% of the country's had COVID, what is the chance that my child's going to the hospital or dying? If you look at the number of deaths in pediatrics, Senator, you can see that there are more deaths of in people who have had it, uh, of people who have had the disease. Uh, Senator, we also know from other studies that the optimal degree of protection when you get infection is to get vaccinated after infection. And in fact, showing reinfection in the era of Omicron and the sublineages that vaccination but you can't body. answer the question I asked. The question I ask is how many kids are dying and how many kids are going to the hospital who have already had COVID? The answer may be zero, but you're not even giving us the data because you have so much wanted to protect everybody from all the data because we're not smart enough to look at the data. When you release data earlier, when the CDC released the data, they left out the category of 18 to 49 on whether or not there was a health benefit for, for adults 18 to 49. Why was it left out? When critics finally complained, it was finally included because there was no health benefit from taking a booster between the 18 to 49 and the CDC study. Another question for you. The NIH continues to refuse to voluntarily divulge the names of scientists who receive royalties and from which companies. Over the period of time from 2010 to 2016, 27,000 royalty payments were paid to 1,800 NIH employees. We know that, not because you told us, but because we forced you to tell us through the Freedom of Information Act. Over $193 million was given to these 18 employee, 1,800 employees. Can you tell me that you have not received a royalty from any entity that you ever oversaw the distribution of money in research grants? Um, well, first of all, let's talk about Royalties. That's the question. No, that's the question. Have oh, you ever no, overseen, Senator, have you ever received a royalty plan. payment from a company that you later oversaw money going to that company? You know, I don't know as a fact, but I doubt it. I well, well here's the thing is, why don't you let us know? Why don't you reveal how much you've gotten and from what entities? 
The NIH okay. refuses. Yeah. Look, we ask them. We ask them. The NIH, we ask them whether or not who got it and how much. They refuse right. to tell us. They sent it redacted. Here's what I want to know. It's not just about you. Everybody on the vaccine committee, have any of them ever received money from the people who make vaccines? Right. Can you tell me uh, that? Can you tell me if Senator, anybody on the vaccine approval committees ever received gonna, any money from people who make the vaccine? Soundbite number one, are you going to let me answer a question? Okay, so let me give you some information. First of all, according to the regulations, people who receive royalties are not required to divulge them even on their financial statement according to the buy dole act so let me give you some example from 2015 to 2020 i the only royalties i have was my lab and i made a monoclonal antibody for use in vitro reagent that had nothing to do with patients and during that period of time my royalties range from $21 a year to $7,700 a year. And the average per year was $191.46. It's, it's all redacted and you can't get any information on the 1,800 Senator, scientists. Your, your time is so long we want to know Senator whether Senator or not Paul. people got money from the people who made the manufacturing Senator Paul, vaccine. your time is long over expired. I gave you an additional two and a half minutes. The witness has responded. We are going to move on. Senator Sanders. Thank you all very much uh, for being here. Um, one of the concerns that I have uh, in terms of where we are now and where we might be in the future is that the American people do not have ready access to the information they need uh, as to how they can receive uh, the best treatment available uh, for COVID. Uh, an example, uh, a 60-year-old uh, gentleman wakes up in the morning, has bad symptoms, tests positive for COVID. I worry that that person and millions of them may not even know that there are therapeutics out there that can help them, that they may have five days, only five, they have to take it within the first five days of symptoms. Uh, can you tell us, Dr. Walensky, what we can do to make it easier for people to get uh, the therapeutics that they need. Thank you, Senator Sanders. This is key in terms of our distributing and equitably distributing not only um, our therapeutics, but in fact, even before our therapeutics, um, communities and, and at-risk people need to understand to do a test because that's the gateway into getting these therapeutics. So we need to have testing available, accessible. Um, a lot of what the ASPR has done in distributing home tests. We need to have um, therapeutics available in at-risk communities across the country. And then we need to do public health campaigns so that people understand that a test should be done and that they have access to these therapeutics. All right, but the concern is that in some of them, at least, you should take the drug within five, the first five days. All right, are you confident that we have a system that if somebody wakes up, they're going to have to get a prescription from a doctor? Do they have a doctor that they can get a prescription from within the first few days? Do they know where to get the drug? Uh, and do they have the money to pay for that drug? So the drugs are free, the tests are free, um, but I'm not sure that everybody knows that. And we have expanded our rollout and accessibility of Paxlovid, but I will also say that just like early in our vaccine work, we have seen inequities in how that ba Paxlovid has been used. We'll have more data forthcoming from the CDC soon on that, but we have a lot of work to do in the equitable distribution of Paxlovid and to getting the education to the communities, to community health centers, to uh, physicians in rural areas. All right. Should our goal be, it seems to me, to make it nice and simple that if somebody is feeling ill, if somebody has COVID, they can dial a 1-800 number and get the drug as quickly as possible. Is that the goal that we're striving, striving yes, for? Yes, we need to do that under the EUA and, and with the um, caveats that there are some things like um, renal insufficiency or drug-drug interactions that need to be assessed. So we need to make sure that those assessments are complete as well. All right, I want to change course a little bit here. Uh, and touch on a subject that I don't think we talk about enough as a nation, and that is that 
we have a significant shortage of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, other healthcare providers, and that shortage has only been exacerbated as a result of burnout related to COVID. Uh, I know that's not necessarily within your jurisdiction, but you can give us, can you give us some thoughts about how serious that uh, shortage of medical personnel is and what we might want to do to address it? Yes, I think it's key, not only medical personnel, but public health personnel. A DeBeaumont Foundation uh, survey demonstrated that we are about 80,000 public health workers in deficit right now, and that we need to not only retain the ones who have stepped up to the plate during the COVID-19 pandemic, but we need to foster and invest in future public health workers as well as health care workers. And that includes loan repayment. It includes investing in the time and, and making sure we're competitive from a salary standpoint um, so that we can retain the best of the best in these fields. Okay, let me ask uh, Dr. Kayla for a question. Uh, Senator Paul raised the issue about money and so forth. And I look at it, uh, his questions are valid, but I look at it a slightly different way. I am concerned, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, Moderno, who helped create one of the important vaccines that is saving lives, received, as I recall, about two and a half billion dollars, I think, during the Trump administration. My understanding, and you correct me if I am wrong, is that the gentleman who is the head or was the head of Moderna recently received a golden parachute of some $800 million, two and a half billion of federal funding to develop the drug. Moderna makes huge amounts of money. This guy receives 800 million in golden, golden parachute. Am I right about that? I am not aware of that. It's not something I would keep up with, particularly in this job. Not something you would keep up with? Um, the head of the Food and Drug Administration you would not be concerned that a guy, when we're producing, trying to get vaccines out to people, um, it was, it might, I'm corrected, it's a $926 million golden parachute. If that's true, if the federal government gives a company two and a half billion dollars, and short time later, the head of the company gets a $900 million golden parachute, that is not a concern to you? No, I didn't say it was not a concern. I said it's not something I keep up with in daily life. What I'm very concerned about is the equitable, equitable distribution of vaccines that save lives and antivirals that save lives, and we're not reaching the goals that we need at this well, point. Well, maybe, you know, I think we need, I would hope everybody agrees that we need the financial resources to make sure that everybody has the vaccines. But if one guy ends up with $900 million, rather than using that money to get out the, the, the medicine we need, the vaccines we need out to the people doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much, Madam Chair. Senator Romney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Sanders, uh, I'm one of those that doesn't understand why golden parachutes are provided by boards ever. Doesn't make any sense to me to pay someone to leave uh, a ton of money. I, 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 not that you change the law, I'm just saying I can't figure out why a board would do would do such a thing, worth looking into. Um, I, I appreciate the work that each of you do and the effort that you, you make to uh, help our, uh, the people of our country uh, have healthier lives and, and have long lives. And, and I realize that science is uh, uh, not all-knowing, and from time to time there are mistakes. That's the nature of humankind. But appreciate very much the work that you do and want to express my appreciation personally for that. Um, I do have a, an issue that, that um, is tangenti tangentially related to what you do, but related to the administration in which you're, you're part of, and that is that back in March, uh, I and a number of other members of this committee uh, sent a letter to the administration asking uh, for a, an accounting of how the prior COVID relief money had been spent, uh, and then also how new money that was being requested for emergency uh, uh, supplemental uh, would would be spent. And as part of that response to the, uh, uh, that letter, the administration released a statement regarding the lack of potential con uh, funding for uh, going forward. And I want to read a couple of excerpts from that letter. One is, quote, the federal government is unable to purchase additional life-saving monoclonal antibody treatments and will run out of supply to send to states as soon as late May. 
the federal government cannot purchase sufficient quantities of treatments for immunocompromised individuals, and the federal government will be unable to sustain the testing capacity we built over the last 14 months. And then continuing, ending the purchase of monoclonal antibody treatments, scaling back state and territorial allocations, inability to purchase additional oral antiviral pills, inability to purchase new antivirals, scaling back planned purchases of preventative treatments. Again, what the administration provided to us in Congress in response to our letter was that the administration would be unable to purchase therapeutics and monoclonal antibodies, unable to purchase. Madam Chair, I'd ask unanimous consent that this release from the administration be uh, entered into the record. Without objection, so right. Now, in good faith, I and a number of other people worked over a number of months with members of this party and across the aisle to develop a supplemental bill providing the $10 billion to address this, uh, this inability to purchase the, these things without the $10 billion. But you can imagine my surprise when I find out that on June 8th, the federal government did in fact prioritize $5 billion for the purchase of additional vaccines, $4.9 billion for therapeutics, and $300 million for additional monoclonal antibodies. But it chose not, chose not to do so in February, March, April, or May. Again, saying they had inability to do so. So the administration has recklessly and unilaterally spent taxpayers' money. We've run away inflation. But instead of taking a real inventory of funds they had at their disposal, they said, hey, we need more money. Now, Washington operates on a relationship of trust between the, the respective parties, the administration and Congress, for the administration to provide information to us that was patently false is something which, which dramatically attacks that trust, which I have, members of my party have, members of both parties have. And, and I hope that, that uh, there's an appreciation that for the administration to say they could not purchase these things and then after several months divert some funds and then purchase them is unacceptable and makes our, our ability to work together and have confidence in what we're being told very much shaken to the core. I would ask this question. Uh, if the administration knew in March that it was feasible to buy these things, do you know why they waited to actually do so? Any one of you can respond. Dr. Fauci, you're on the hot seat on the camera, so we'll give it to you. I hope you feel better, by the way. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Senator. I think that question is probably best uh, given to uh, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Dawn O'Connell. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fauci. Thank you, Senator Romney. And thank you for your support in trying to get additional funds freed for us to manage the COVID yeah. response. Yeah, I didn't realize that they weren't needed. I wouldn't have worked as hard with uh, Leader Schumer and with others over many weeks and, and uh, intensive negotiations and gone to my colleagues and told them these monies were necessary had, had I been told that, in fact, they weren't necessary. It's, uh, and I know money is all, you're going to tell me that, hey, we needed to spend money on other things. We had to divert it. But that we could have been told. But we weren't told that. We were told we could not purchase therapeutics or monoclonal antibodies. And now you have. And we had to do so with significant trade-offs, trade-offs that we, none of us wanted to make. Um, as the, uh, but, but we should have been, we, we're part of Congress. When you're asking us for $10 billion, we should be appraised of what those trade-offs are and, in, and have that discussion and help make that decision together. You shouldn't be able to say, hey, we're, we're looking at trade-offs. We're not going to tell you about them. Just give us some more money. I, isn't that not unacceptable in a relationship between an administration and Congress? We've worked hard to be transparent with our funding needs. And again, I've appreciated the support you've given us uh, in trying to unlock additional funds. Uh, making the decision to spend this money, taking it away from critical programs is absolutely difficult. And it's something we didn't think was acceptable. Uh, we're now at a point because Congress has not given us additional funding that we've had to do these things that are unacceptable. Well, we, uh, my time is up. I just say we, we agreed on one word, and that is unacceptable. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, as New Mexico continues to battle the COVID-19 pandemic, we are now also battling the largest wildfires the state has ever seen. Wildfires that were started as a controlled burn by the federal government and two fires that got out of control. So while I very much respect that 
People keep telling me 99.8% of controlled burns are always under control. I'm more interested in the 0.2% that destroyed our state. These dual crises have stretched the resources of the state to the breaking point. As New Mexicans flee natural disaster, in many cases taking only the belongings they can carry, they face increased exposure to COVID-19 virus, which has run rampant in the congregate settings being used to house evacuees. Assistant Secretary O'Connell, how are you coordinating to support New Mexico's COVID-19 response in light of the wildfires? Thank you, Senator Lujan. And we continue to keep the people of New Mexico who are currently experiencing these two tragedies um, in our minds. Um, with the Secretary on May 9th, realizing the extent of what was happening in New Mexico, declared a public health emergency. And that public health emergency freed up uh, flexibilities for the healthcare system there uh, in order to respond in the emergent condition, uh, including uh, providing telehealth for Medicare beneficiaries, uh, freezing the Medicaid rolls so no one would, be, would lose insurance during this time of tragedy. Um, at ASPR, we continue to support through our hospital preparedness program, New Mexico's coalition, uh, healthcare coalition, which was responsible for evacuating many of the hospitals and long-term care facilities, nursing homes. And so we continue to work closely with our colleagues there to make sure that um, everybody is, is safe and accounted for. Uh, we also run the Medical Reserve Corps, and the Medical Reserve Corps in New Mexico has been activated in order to respond uh, to the wildfires, so we continue to support our colleagues out there through that effort. And we've been in close contact with FEMA. We've offered virtual support to FEMA out in New Mexico, uh, and wherever we can be helpful, we are trying to be. And we've not stopped our COVID response. We're continuing to make vaccines and therapeutics and tests available to those in New Mexico that need them. And uh, Assistant Secretary O'Connell, this is a follow-up to uh, the, the solid answer with programs that have been made available. The, the, the follow-up is how is HHS ensuring that these resources are being communicated to those impacted, especially given the current lack of cellular and broadband service in many regions of the state, which is non-existent in these communities? Thank you, Senator. So we continue to have boots on the ground in New Mexico. We've got uh, regional emergency coordinators in the state that continue to communicate with um, with, with uh, city and local leaders. We also have our CMS representatives who are making sure that the Medicare and Medicaid provisions are being well communicated to those beneficiaries um, and everything we can. To, uh, we've got several regional representat representatives leading this effort for us in New Mexico and continue to rely on their ability to communicate on the ground. Now, well, I said earlier that many families were forced to evacuate. They were living in congregate settings but they were not eligible for the fourth COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Walensky, will you commit to reconsidering CDC guidelines for the fourth COVID-19 shot to account for the risks of people fleeing from natural disasters who are forced into compact living conditions? Thank you, Senator Lujan, and let me add my support and strength to the people of New Mexico who are experiencing these natural disasters. Maybe if I could just back up and let you know some of the things that CDC has been doing in including um, drafting recommendations and documents like wildfire smoke and COVID-19, public health strategies to reduce um, exposure to wildfire smoke during the COVID-19 pandemic, going to a public health, a public disaster shelter during COVID-19. We have documents, we're providing technical assistance on the ground as well as public health communication, exposure assessment and epidemiologic data in order to support the efforts ongoing there. And we've been working in our nat nat uh, National Center for Environmental Health over the last decade to support, support health departments to prepare for, respond to and recover from wildfire disasters. Specifically to your question about booster shots for this population, CDC is committed to continuously reviewing the data on the safety and efficacy and need for booster shots. We do so all the time. Um, we did, we uh, uh, strengthened our recommendation for those for a fourth shot for those over the age of 50. And should we see a need, safety and efficacy, we will continue to expand, but we certainly want to follow the data as we do so. I appreciate that, Dr. Walensky. And Madam Chair, as my time expires, I still have a couple of questions I'll submit into the record, but I'm hoping that that's a long way of saying yes, definitively to making these changes. Not all of us are over 50. There, there were a lot of, and I just turned 50, so I can say that now. Um, 
there are a lot of young families and children and grandchildren who are in these settings above the age of five um, where we had them all in one place. And when we would get scares of spread or those that had tested positive, it's a perfect place to help provide additional support in a community where it's hard to get to and we don't always have the availability. Um, so this is an area that I will continue to push and I'm hopeful we can find a, a positive remedy here because New Mexico is not going to be the only state facing natural disasters. We're in that season right now. And so I'm hopeful that there will be some positive direction in how we can take care of more people. I, I thank you very much and Madam Chair, I yield back. Senator Cassidy. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for, thank you for your efforts on part of our country. Uh, and of course, what we're hearing is that there has to be more money appropriated and dire consequences if not allocated. But that begs the question of the stewardship of the, of the current dollars being allocated. Now, uh, and so I personally think, and I think others agree, that physically showing up to work is important. So Ms. O'Connell, how many days in the last month were you physically in your office? The vast majority of those days. Can you give me a number? I mean, I, it's so frustrating. I've never been able to get a straight answer from one of you as to how many days you are in the office and what is the return to work policy. So just give me how many days this past week. And if it's five, I'm, I'm pleased. How many, five, how many days in this last week? So HHS has continued its return to work uh, starting in April. We're bringing everybody back. No, by how the many end days of June. have you personally been in your office this last week? Multiple days, okay. of course. This is not hard to remember. It's only five days. And if you dissemble, it makes me think that you've not been in the office and you don't want to give me a straight answer. And I'm speaking on behalf of the American people who are paying taxes and a lot of salaries, and they think people aren't showing up to work. How many days in the last five were you physically in your office? We continue to work. Okay, Dr. Caleb, how many days in the last five were you physically in your office? I was down in North Carolina Monday and Tuesday because the two 18-year-olds that you met at my confirmation okay, then, then graduated a week ago. from then, then Give me five days. When there wasn't a family issue, go the previous week. I, I Five uh, every day when I've been in Washington and not on business travel, I go into the office at White Oak. Okay, I, I get that. So... So every day you're in Washington does not mean that when you're that you are here. So are you either doing business travel and part of FDA? Are you phys and and but if not, you're physically in your office. It, yes, except for um, family events yeah, like Dr. Walensky. Graduation. How many days in the last five were you physically in your office? So I'm not in my office today, but I feel like I'm working on. No, 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 no. Feel like. How but I believe days? I'm working on site. So I have been in, uh, uh, I've been traveling. So I've been in my office two and I've been traveling for two. One of them I was in fact in your So in the office? last yep. month, do you typically work out of Washington or do you work out of your home in the Northeast? We're an agency at CDC up uh, boy, it's really hard on to get the work, answer. on the job work. And in we, fact, some of our work is in your, in your state. When I you get that. To I get that. But let me read something from, from Elon Musk, who's asking Tesla workers to go back to 40 hours a week. The more senior you are, the more visible you must be. That's why I lived in the factory. There's companies that don't require this. When was the last time they shipped a great product? You don't ship great products by phoning it in. There's a perception that your agencies are underperforming. Now, if you're underperforming and you're not showing up, that is uh, not good stewardship. Now, let me ask, because I understand that HHS has a policy which is allowing people to come back every two weeks for eight hours a day. Now, uh, do any of you have a policy in your agency which is different than this pilot program of only requesting eight hours in the office every two weeks? Ms. O'Connell, yes, no. We require more than that in the office. Thank you. Mr. Caleb, Dr. Caleb. Yes, we, I mean, we've talked a lot. We have a pilot program which adjusts every individual to the optimal uh, working situation for them to be productive. Now, so that tells me that it's really up to the individual to decide no, whether it's she up to the individual, their supervisor. So, and if, the so in your laboratories, does every laboratory worker show up every day physically? Because in a laboratory, you got to be there. Well, Senator Cassidy, we're both doctors. 
uh, you, you know, everyone who has a job to do in the laboratory that requires them to be there is there every day, but you also know that when you analyze data. Yeah, analyze uh, data, but if you've got a lab tech, the lab tech has to be there. Absolutely. Else. So is yes, the lab sir. tech there every day? Yes. And, uh, and I'm sorry to be insistent, but it's hard to get an answer. Dr. Walensky. Yeah, our laboratory, the people who need to be in our labs are working in our labs, but I will also say that. Uh, are they when working full data, time 40 hours a week? <laughs> when I have a data need at midnight on a Saturday night, people are working. They're not necessarily in the workplace, but they're working. And I get that, but if it's a, it a lab employee who is only productive if they're in a lab, uh, are, are they are they working 40 hours a week? People who need to be on site in the lab or on site in the lab. People who are deployed to the field, deployed yeah, internationally. Yeah, I think there's a lot of working outside but the you've got I've got 18,000 employees, and I can't believe they're all deployed. You know, I'm going to finish with this. You're asking for more money, and Ms. O'Connell, you suggested that there's tough trade-offs that have to be made. That by golly, if you don't give us money, something's going to be sacrificed. I suspect you haven't laid off a single person. I also know that you have the ability to monitor their at-home work history as to whether or not they're actually logging on. I'd be interested in seeing that data. But you've got maintenance people who haven't been employed for two and a half years. And I suspect they've not been laid off. But you're asking for more taxpayer dollars, asking tough choices for that family at home trying to make their balance work. And yet, and yet it seems as if there's not a tight ship being run. Uh, I'm over. I apologize. I yield. Senator Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Burr for this hearing, and thank you to all of our witnesses today for being here and for your service. Um, Dr. Califf, I want to start with a question to you about the infant formula shortage. Um, I want to follow up on comments that you made at the start of today's hearing. When you testified in front of this committee three weeks ago, you told me that within two months we should be quote, beyond normal and with a plethora, close quote, of infant formula. Then, as Chair Murray noted, Abbott announced last night that its formula production plant in Sturgis, Michigan, had flooded, which will, quote, likely delay production and distribution of new product for a few weeks, close quote. But despite that setback, as I understood your answer to Chair Murray earlier, you still hope to have a, quote, super supply close quote, of baby formula on shelves in the next two to three weeks, which I take to mean more formula available than was typical prior to the Sturgis plant shutting down. So is that correct? And if so, how do you expect to achieve that goal with Abbott saying that the Sturgis plant will remain shut down for another few weeks? Yes, that's correct with two assumptions. One is that the companies stick to the production um, data that they've given us, which they've already demonstrated they can do. The second is there's no other natural disaster like the unexpected one last night. But we have, you know, one thing that's happened is we now get production data from all the companies involved. It adds up to a surplus relative to the needs that are demonstrated by the number, number of babies using formula <clears throat> over the last several years. So we should be over that number easily. And that doesn't count the fly formula um, uh, uh, formula coming in. So what you're indicating to me is that other producers have been increasing their production. Absolutely. All of the manufacturers in the U.S., remember there were only four, which is another right. issue. They've all stepped up and are running their plants 24 by 7, and the numbers show it. Okay. So during the last hearing, you indicated that an interagency committee has developed a comprehensive plan to get this super supply on the shelves. Will you provide that written comprehensive plan to my office after this hearing? We'll, we'll provide our plan, yes. Thank you. And will your, um, and once we've looked at the plan, we may want to follow up with you all for a briefing. That works for you? Okay. Um, second question is to Dr. Fauci and Assistant Secretary O'Connell. Uh, Dr. Fauci, for nearly two years, I've been asking you when a COVID-19 vaccine for children under age five would be ready and they are now nearly there. While vaccines have been available for older individuals for quite some time, the infant and toddler vaccine has been much slower, leaving many families with young children in a precarious position as they try to keep their kids safe. Do you anticipate that children ages six months to five years will be able to get their first dose by the end of this month? Well, again, uh, Senator, thank you for that question, but. I do not want to get ahead of the advisory committee. You heard from my opening statement and that of uh, Commissioner uh, Califf. 
that in fact the VERPAC, which is the advisory committee to the FDA, made a recommendation, a positive recommendation for an emergency use authorization. The next step would be the CDC, right. in which Dr. Walensky's advisory committee will likely, uh, uh, in fact, likely, I'm sure they will, uh, look at the data and make a recommendation. And then at the end of the day, it will be the director of the CDC's uh, uh, obligation and duty and, and uh, to, to make a recommendation. So I, I hope it does, but we never want to get ahead of the data. The data look very, very good, Senator. I mean, as you, yeah. as you heard from, uh, from Commissioner Califf, the data look really quite good. So I anticipate that that's going to happen, but it would not be appropriate for me to get ahead of my CDC colleagues. Got, got it. And just briefly, Dr. Walensky, what does the timeline look like for that review? Um, we were, are going to review tomorrow and working on Saturday as well because we understand the urgency of this for American parents and um, recognize that even on a holiday weekend, we need to be doing this to get it to American parents. Right. Thank you. And Assistant Secretary O'Connell, how will the administration work to educate parents on the safety of this vaccine and help as many families as possible to get their youngest children vaccinated? Absolutely. So assuming that the decisions come through as we may expect, the approval and uh, recommendation, we have... Uh, it made available 10 million doses for states to order, and uh, the vast majority of them have placed those orders. That will allow us to ship out as soon as an EUA, should it come, comes, uh, with the expectation that uh, parents can begin uh, getting their children vaccinated uh, next week. So that is our intention. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chair Murray. Senator Collins. Thank you. Dr. Califf, we know that the baby formula crisis was exacerbated by the fact that people weren't working in the mail room and that inspectors were not working a normal schedule in the baby formula plants. In response to a question from Dr. Cassidy, you referred to a return to work pilot program. How many FDA employees are part of that pilot program? as opposed to working full-time right now in the office or in the field? Well, of course, as you allude to, they're all working full-time. I'll have to get back to you on the exact number, but it's the majority are in the pilot program in one way or another. The goal is to adjust uh, to the maximum productivity uh, and job satisfaction. And but they can't, they can't do their work if they're not present. Well, if it's a job that uh, where they'll places. do their work best, if they are present, they will be, they are required to be there. Well, I'd really appreciate getting the data on that. And I look forward to bringing the data to you. I think it's going to be interesting. I'll just say, you know, I was at Google before this, as opposed to Elon Musk, I think Google's doing pretty well with their hybrid uh, program. Let me switch to another issue. I'm very alarmed by the response that I heard to uh, Senator Sanders' question where uh, he said you should be able to just dial 1-800 to get a prescription, and the administration has pushed very hard on the test and treat program uh, so that you test positive and you get Paxlovid right off. And here's why I'm concerned. The first is that Paxlovid interacts in a negative way with a lot of commonly taken medications, including blood thinners, for example. Second, just on Tuesday, Pfizer announced it was halting enrollment in a trial for Paxlovid in standard risk patients both vaccinated and unvaccinated, after its study revealed that the treatment was not effective in reducing symptoms in that group. So what we've heard today and what the administration seems to be pushing is this notion that Paxlovid is going to be the answer if you have a positive COVID test. Do you really think calling 1-800 is a good way to handle the prescription of a drug that's been found to not be effective for standard risk patients and has interactions 
with a lot of medications? Thank you for asking that um, question. I, the place I agree with Senator Sanders is that we have a vastly inequitable distribution of life-saving vaccines and antivirals now, particularly, I know you're from a predominantly rural state, particularly rural people are suffering because they have low, lower vaccination rates and less access. I don't agree that uh, an individual just calling a 1-800 number with no um, clinician um, involved is a good idea. Uh, first of all, because uh, the drug's not indicated except in people who are at higher risk. Um, it's not that it's totally ineffective and lower risk. If you look at those data, I'd love to go over those with you later, but the, it's not worth the um, prescription in that case. The benefits are minimal. So I think there does need to be an intermediary, either a pharmacist or a physician, who can look at the risks and the drug interactions and make a good judgment. But the concept is right that having to find a physician, get an appointment, can take over five days for many Americans. So we have to have a system that uh, deals with that issue. Dr. Walensky, David Leonhard recently wrote in the New York Times that while masks can work, the evidence suggests that broad mask mandates have not done much to reduce COVID caseloads over the past two years. And in fact, he says that daily average cases per capita during last winter's surge were practically the same in counties and states that had mask mandates and those that did not. And we've seen that Hong Kong, despite almost universal mask wearing, recently endured one of the world's worst COVID outbreaks. There are proven ways to lower hospitalizations and deaths. We know that, vaccinations, therapeutics, but mask mandates have contributed to a breakdown of trust in public health officials given the scant evidence that they actually lower caseloads. What specific data has the CDC examine that demonstrate that broad-based mask mandates lead to lower caseloads, because I can't find any. Thank you, Senator Collins. I, I actually believe that that is a, is a piece that's undergone uh, substantial criticism for, for moving forward, but I will say that there are numerous studies that have demonstrated, and we have to look at this over time because there are secular trends as to when these mask mandates have occurred. There are population and aggregate anonymized data that have demonstrated decreased rates of disease when mask mandates have been put in place earlier in the pandemic, and we have to control for all of the comp, uh, things as to what has been opened, what um, interventions have been available, but there have been other studies for certain to refute those data. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Chair Murray, and thanks to all of our panelists for being here today. Um, I'm going to focus my questions on uh, questions of data um, and data sharing and how that, res how that reflects our um, um, ability to respond to the pandemic, but I just, I just want to, before I do that, I want to reinforce the comments that Chair Murray made at the beginning of this hearing, um, that we are making progress on the pandemic, um, and we are in a much better position than we have been, but it is essential that we've got sustained resources so that we are ready um, as we look to whatever comes next with this pandemic. And so I just want to associate myself with Chair Murray um, in urging my colleagues to support the funding that we need so that our COVID response can continue. And um, I appreciate very much my, my colleagues, um, Senator Cassidy and Senator Collins, and, and, and their, uh, their work on accountability. But I just want to ask you all a simple yes or no question. Has the work of your agency been hampered in any way by people not being in the office? Could you just say just yes or no? No. 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 Dr. Fauci? No. OK, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Walensky, I want to bring up something that you and I have talked about. This has to do with um, um, the resolving the issues around sharing public health data 
with uh, tribes. Uh, this is a challenge that I think we both uh, are aware of and have been talking about. Um, for folks who aren't um, paying close attention to this, tribal epidemiology centers were created by Congress as an essential public health authority um, in Indian country. And since the beginning of the pandemic, they faced real challenges accessing public health data through the CDC. Um, I've introduced a bill to resolve this issue. I'm grateful for the work of my colleagues as well on this, especially Senator Lujan. Um, Dr. Walensky, as you know, the GAO has issued a report outlining recommendations to resolve the issues. And um, uh, I would just appreciate knowing, I know you appreciate the challenges of this. Can you um, uh, commit to working with us to make sure that those GAO recommendations for the CDC, um, the uh, report back on that is August 31st, 2022. Um, could you please commit to us to uh, following through on those recommendations? Thank you, Senator Smith. I've appreciated the conversations I've had with Center Consortium and meeting with them later this month, as well as through the summer meeting with the tribe specifically about how best to work to data for data sharing. Um, we are aware of the GAO report and that we have two specific items to address and we're on a track to provide timely response to those. But I do want to just comment that this is not just a data issue with tribes, but a real <coughs> larger data issue at hand, that CDC does not have the authority to request, receive, share data in a way that gives us a comprehensive overview not only through CDC and a national forecast, but to tribes, to localities, to from one county to another, we do not have the authority to do so. We've gotten some of that through the public health emergency, um, through uh, the CARES Act, where we were able to receive lab data, through CMS authorities, where we've been able to receive hospital data. But it's been really challenging during this pandemic that we still have holes in the data that we're able to receive. And now, um, as we look to monkeypox and the outbreaks of monkeypox, we are again revisiting the challenges that are that we are not able to see all of the data that would be necessary to receive and to share so that we can have a coherent response. Thank you. Well, Dr. Walensky, you have um, anticipated my next question, so I appreciate that. I want to get to that in a minute. Uh, just to close out on the tribal data sharing, um, I would just ask that we stay in close touch on this as we approach January 20, excuse me, August uh, 31st, um, so that we can resolve this and those tribal epidemiology centers can, um, can um, have access to the data that they are legally required to have. Looking more broadly, I'm aware that the CDC does have challenges with data, and I just want to try to help to tease this out a little bit in the few seconds that I have left. Um, for example, does the CDC have the authority to require hospitals to report their COVID data? And if they do, is that authority permanent or um, is it temporary? Um, it's temporary through the public health emergency and it's not CDC's, it's through CMS. And have hospitals been reporting the data that, that I mean, do we have all the data that we need at this moment? Uh, we do not. We receive the data that CMS has the authority to request, but we don't receive all the data that we would like to receive. Um, I want to just uh, acknowledge that um, Senator Kane um, has a bill which I co-sponsor, the Improving Data in Public Health, um, which would make the crucial improvements that I have come to understand we really need to make to strengthen data sharing um, between public health authorities and the CDC and the federal government more broadly. And that to make sure that this data sharing isn't temporary, but that it is permanent so that we can continue to be responsive um, at the federal level and have the data so that we all can make good decisions um, about how best to respond to the public health challenges that we will continue to have. And we are very grateful for your support and Senator Kane's on that bill. Thank you very much. So I look forward to working with my colleagues and with Senator Kane on that as well. Thank you Thank very you. much. Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Uh, Walensky, it was about a month ago in an appropriations hearing, I asked Dr. Fauci about lockdowns. And it was based upon the Johns Hopkins study that said that tactic basically was neutral on mortality. And I don't think it uh, got into maybe what mortality might have been caused due to the fact that we were locked down in other areas. But would you agree uh, with Dr. Fauci on that, that we probably won't ever need to use lockdowns again on COVID as we currently know it? I certainly hope not, Senator Braun. Um, I know that that uh, Hopkins study uh, had some flaws and that there have been other studies that have refuted that. We'd be happy to get you more details on that. But um, 
certainly we're doing everything in our power to prevent that from happening, but uh, COVID has sent us numerous curveballs, so I will never say never. I might also add that in everything I observed and keeping in touch with the business community, who took it pretty seriously, uh, they did not think that transmission was occurring at work. It was mostly elsewhere, and that locking those businesses down, of course, I think we're dealing with those consequences currently. Um, another question, when it comes to vaccine mandates, Supreme Court finally weighed in and said that did not make sense when we were gonna try to force businesses down to 100 employees to either have their employees get a vaccine or lose their job. Um, that seemed like the ultimate heavy hand of government. Uh, would you ever recommend uh, doing that again? Because the administration seemed to err on the side of vaccine mandates and lockdowns, which I talked about earlier. So mandates are generally, vaccine mandates are generally a local um, decision. And what I will say is uh, we at CDC are uh, for promoting more people to get vaccinated because those who are vaccinated and boosted have decreased risk of severe disease and death. So, so generally we would support getting more people vaccinated. Well, I'd like to cite the fact that the administration has forced it through all federal employees, and I believe that initiation of what would have been the biggest mandate for getting vaccinated, you know, came from the Biden administration, so through an executive order. Um, I agree with you that you know, local prerogative uh, should come into play, but this was not that. Um, you care to comment further on that? CDC stand is the, the more people who are vaccinated and boosted, uh, the decreased risk of severe outcomes and deaths. So we've now gone um, a couple years, we've learned a lot, and I think the data has shown that this has ravaged in a disproportionate way in the elderly with comorbidities. And I'd like your kind of assessment going forward, if we're with the general dynamic of what we know about COVID, does it make sense that we protect better where the data has shown that we've had the most issues with? And also parallel this to the flu. I know it's more transmissible, but the flu generally has a broader uh, fatality rate in here uh, Senator Paul talked about, about it a little earlier. We know that it has really hit one category very hard. And you think we're protecting them well enough. And you think it makes sense to take the broad approaches for so much of the country that was either asymptomatic or had mild symptoms. Um, I think we need to do both. Um, certainly our elder community has been among those that have been highest at risk, highest risk of severe disease and death. But I will also say that COVID is one of the top leading killers of children right now. Deaths among children during the COVID pandemic have been higher than we generally see from, from COVID, have been higher than we've seen for flu. So um, I actually think we need to protect young children as well as protect um, everyone with a vaccine and especially protect elders. I will say that um, we have uh, recently uh, endorsed and recommended boosters for all those over the age of 50, um, a second booster for all those the age, over the age of 50, and we will have forthcoming data later this week that'll demonstrate compared to a third booster that those over the age of 50 who've gotten a fourth have a sevenfold decreased risk of death. So we are actually doing both of those simultaneously, and that's what I think we need to be doing. Thank you. And uh, finally, for Dr. Fauci, uh, of course, we read this week after 675 years we finally have found the origins of the Black Plague. Uh, care to give us an update on where we're at on tracking down the origins of COVID-19? Thank you for that question, Senator. There have been a number of papers that have come out from highly qualified virologists and viral phylogeneticists that indicate that this is very, very likely a jumping species from an animal host, perhaps through an intermediate host into a human uh, species, which then spread throughout the human population, certainly and almost certainly originating in China, in Wuhan. We still open up and keep always an open mind as to whether or not this had to do with a virus that was isolated out in the environment and that came into a lab 
and then had what most people referred to as a lab leak. I believe that is less likely that that's the case, but I also believe we need to keep an open mind and have all possibilities be investigated. But the evidence from the virology community points strongly towards a natural occurrence. Very quickly, do you think the Chinese will cooperate with you to try to get to the thorough bottom of it? Senator, I certainly hope so, because we're not going to get an answer that's a definitive answer. I mean, even if they do cooperate, we may not do that. But certainly, for example, if we want to continue surveillance among bat populations and other wild animals that might serve as an intermediary host, as well as understanding what was going on in some of their laboratories, I believe it's essential to have cooperation and collaboration with the Chinese. Thank you. Sen thank you. Senator Hickenlooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I want to just first thank all of you again. You've been here repeatedly. Um, I often wonder watching these, the back and forth of these uh, hearings, what message it sends to young people deciding whether they want to get into public service. Um, it doesn't always look pleasant, but I uh, appreciate your your maintenance of good spirits as you go through, obviously, uh, difficult, but I think important discussions. Um, Dr. Kale, if I'm going to start, I'm going to try and look a little more forward, um, just because I am worried about the future equally as much as trying to uh, review the mistakes we've made in the past. You know, the unprecedented COVID-19 clinical trial landscape has allowed for timely availability of vaccines and therapies that have been essential to fighting this pandemic. Uh, in this increasingly global world, uh, we can and, and I think really have to work closely with our allied partners to advance scientific and research efforts. Um, my question to you is, should we be thinking about multi-regional clinical trials as a way to expand volume and scope of clinical trial data? And if so, how do we get there? And that's, I know we've talked about it before, but it's, I, I yeah. just keep coming back to this well. Well, thanks for giving me a chance to talk about my favorite thing. That's what I've done for a living my entire career is multi-regional clinical trials in cardiovascular disease, and that's what we need to do. Uh, we're all very focused on diversity in clinical trials within the United States, but we're only 4% of the world's population. So if we really believe that, we need to be doing trials that are relevant to the populations all over the world. And I will point out again, as Dr. Lewinsky pointed out, Walensky pointed out, we, we have a fragmented system in the U.S. So yes, we depend on Israel for data. The fourth dose decision by the FDA was made based on Israeli data. For in many cases, we depend on the U.K. for clinical trial results that are critical to us. With all the technology and prowess we have in this country, we, we got to do better, and it's going to be a, a focus. And the CDC needs to have the authority to get the data it needs so that we can be as good as the Israelis in producing just in time data that's needed. Yeah. When I was a kid, Marshall McLuhan wrote a book, and one of the key elements was information is power. I think that's more true today than ever. Um, Dr. Fauci, uh, many of us here have been beating the drum loudly on pandemic preparedness and pandemic prevention. Uh, I think it's imperative that we make investments today that will help us better understand and prepare uh, for viruses tomorrow. And I know that's, this has been, we watched some of the discussion on this already. Um, the president's put out a pandemic preparedness plan and submitted a mandatory five-year funding request to Congress to truly stay ahead of the curve. What progress do you think we've lost due to the inability of Congress to significantly invest in the pandemic preparedness and pandemic pre prevention? Yeah. Well, thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, the pandemic preparedness involves multiple uh, buckets, uh, basic clinical and translational science to develop the products such as the vaccines and the antivirals that have helped us so dramatically during the current outbreak, as well as a number of public health issues involving, for example, the CDC, the FDA, Barter, Asper, and others. When you look at what has not been available from the standpoint of resources, we have a pandemic preparedness plan that is based on what we call the prototype pathogen approach, which was to look at various families of viruses, particularly, 
and to develop commonalities among them so that we'll be able in the next challenge with an emerging uh, microbe, mostly likely a virus, that we'll have enough backlog experience that we'll be able to do it in the time frame that we did with coronavirus, which as you know was 65 days from the recognition of the virus to a phase one trial. Right, so, let, so I get, let, let me interrupt you just because I'm gonna run out of time here. The, the real question though is how much do we lose by delaying the appropriate investments to, to complete that, that uh, pre pre preparedness work? Yeah, you lose significant amount. I mean, every time you pull back on resources, the pace and the cadence of the work slows down. Sometimes you can't even start a new project, but the projects that are ongoing, if you don't get the resources to fully implement them, you will delay the development of interventions. Or, or have to take money from one other pool that, that gets sidelined and you interrupt something else. Right, I follow that. That's, okay, that's I'm out of time. Um, uh, so I yield back to the chair, but I again want to thank each of you for your public service. I realize science is not perfect. It's not binary um, and you have difficult, complicated jobs and I'm, uh, I'm grateful. Thank you, Senator Marshall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just yesterday, we learned that in the month of May, our Border Patrol encountered an unprecedented 239,000 migrants at the southern border, the highest monthly total in DH history. And now, thanks to our inhumane open border policies, every state is now a border state. In my home state of Kansas, a person dies most every day from fentanyl poisoning. Nationwide, over 200 people are dying daily from fentanyl. The numbers on the rise, and this is now an epidemic. Just last week in Kansas City, authorities seized 15,000 counterfeit pills laced with fentanyl. Chair Murray, in your state of Washington, five people are dying per day from drug overdose. And Ranking Member Burr, in your state, nine North Carolinians are dying every day from drug overdose. I don't have to remind people on this committee or our panel the fentanyl precursors are made in China, then the Chinese work with the cartels to process it into a lethal fentanyl, often lacing other opioids, marijuana, meth, Adderall, Xanax, amongst others. And all across the nation, a counterfeit oxycodone pills, like the ones behind me, are now actually laced with fentanyl. And unfortunately, just one pill can kill. And in the case of one young student in Shawnee, Kansas, it only took half of a fake Percocet pill to take his life. Dr. Walensky, my colleague, Senator Haggerty, from the great state of Tennessee, has introduced a bill that would expand Title 42, expedited removal authority to combat the drug overdose epidemic resulting from drug smuggling across our southern border. Dr. Walensky, I'd like to ask you yes or no, would you commit to expanding the Title 42 authority to turn back migrants to combat this prolific drug smuggling across the U.S.-Mexico border in an effort to stop the flow and the epidemic of fentanyl that is killing Americans every day. Thank you, Senator. I, I'd like to just back up and say that CDC is a public health agency, not an immigration agency. And the question of Title 42 is a public health policy. The question of Title 42 that was posed to me is, is there a public health emergency that should bar people from coming into the United States? We now have, as of April 1st, when I, when I commented on this, we now have the tools, the tests, the vaccines, um, and the therapeutics that are available. Our hospitals are not full. Everyone and men, most people in this room are not wearing a mask. There is no longer a public health emergency. So Dr. Walensky, I appreciate that, but I hope you realize that, that fentanyl poisoning is killing more individuals ages 18 to 45 than COVID-19. So for the same reasons that you instituted Title 42 for COVID, why wouldn't you consider instituting it uh, for, for fentanyl poisoning as well as would you commit yes or no to tracking this similarly the way you did for COVID? To the larger immigration question, I turn things back to you in Congress to address the larger immigration question. Um, as a public health emergency for COVID, which is what Title 42 was put up to do, there was no longer a need. To do you deny that there's an epidemic of fentanyl poisoning across this country? I do not. 
Thank you. Uh, Secretary O'Connell, I have a, a question I'm going to submit for the record for the sake of time. It has to do with we're going to be giving some 300 million more doses of Moderna, more for Pfizer. And from my understanding of the marketplace, there's still a substantial supply chain challenges for our medical products. And to Ranking Member Burr's point, I hope that the administration can give us a plan to provide the ancillary medical products to support the vaccine administration. And we would appreciate some type of a plan in writing. Thank you. My last question uh, for Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci, the NIH is still funding research in China, at least some $8 million since 2020. In the intelligent community's 2022 annual threat assessment, the Chinese Communist Party is presented as one of the top threats to the United States, along with Russia, Iran, Syria, and North Korea. To my knowledge, only China is receiving US research dollars. The CCP controls their scientists and controls the release of research results they work on. However, NIH grants policies requires that grantees to maintain supporting research records, which they cannot do when those records are under control of the Chinese Communist Party. When will you, as director of NIAID, stop funding research in China? Now, thank you for that question, um, Senator Marshall. Uh, we have, at the NIH and in other agencies in the federal government, had very productive peer-reviewed, highly regarded research projects with our Chinese colleagues that have led to some major advances in biomedical research. So I don't think I'd be able to tell you that we are going to stop funding Chinese. We obviously need to be careful and make sure that when we do fund them, we have the proper peer review and we go through all the established guidelines. I might point out that grants that go to foreign countries, including China, have State Department clearance. So any time that we do fund anything in China or any other country, it has to go through a clearance with the State Department. But, but you would not deny that the research done through EcoHealth, that the records, the, the studies from there, that we still do not have access to them. Is that correct? We have, no, Senator Marshall, we have access to an extraordinary amount of information that has gone there. There is a question that people raise with things gone on there that we didn't have access to. But if you look at the grant, the $120,000 to $130,000 a year grant that was given from EcoHealth as a subaward in China to ask a very relevant, high priority question. We have received from them published literature with data that shows that they have done what they were given the grant for. Now, obviously, none of us know everything that's going on in China, but if the, if, if the question at hand is the rather small grant, peer-reviewed, high-priority grant that was given from ECO to China in a sub-award, we have a lot of good information that's in the published. Do you have all the information that, that you think Marshall, that we should at have? At this point, I'm going to move on. We have a number of senators. We have three votes that have been called, and I'm, I'm going to move on to the next uh, person. I am going to turn this the chair over to Senator Hickenlooper. Uh, while I go vote, uh, this next senator I will call on as I do that is Senator Baldwin and Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you for coming up to chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I've been encouraged by the work of this committee and those of you on the panel um, who have helped make more COVID-19 treatments available. Unfortunately, uh, local health departments in Wisconsin have experienced some obstacles when it comes to getting Paxlovid to those in need. Um, Dane County public health officials recently contacted my office to raise their concerns about the lack of a clear policy guidance and reimbursement for this critical treatment. So, Ms. O'Connell, how is ASPR working with states to ensure that uh, local public health departments have the information that they need uh, to make Paxlovid available uh, through the administration's uh, test and treat initiative? And how can folks who are uninsured receive treatment and what additional resources uh, might the administration need to make treatment available to everyone who needs it? 
Thank you so much, Senator Baldwin. I'll take that in two parts. First of all, as far as communicating with state public health departments to make sure they know that this treatment is available and how to access it. Uh, we do weekly stakeholder calls and regular engagements with state health officials. Uh, we also know it's on us to be, you know, it, we, we need to take responsibility for communicating very clearly uh, the importance of this uh, therapy and the, its availability. So we've taken that on in numerous ways with um, various outreach efforts. But, uh, and we continue to work with states to make sure that they're positioning these therapies in places where folks are the most high risk. So that continues to be an ongoing pursuit of ours and we will continue to work at it. Thank you for the feedback on Wisconsin. Um, we will reach out and make sure that we have closed that loop and that they have the information they need. And then part two of your question is about access for the uninsured. So, you know, one of the, um, the impacts of not getting additional supplemental funding is we've had to shut down the uninsured fund. And the uninsured fund was one of the, um, you know, the easiest ways for those without insurance to get coverage during um, the, the COVID response uh, to be able in this once in a lifetime pandemic get the care that they need. Uh, we continue to make Paxlovid even without the uninsured fund. The Paxlovid's available for free. Uh, uh, pharmacies are not allowed to charge a dispensing fee. Uh, so uh, those that are uninsured should be able to access it. We understand an important component of receiving Paxlovid is also having a health care assessment. Uh, and we know that that comes with a fee. Uh, so we encourage those that are uninsured to go to the federally qualified health centers, uh, which provide uh, these services on a sliding scale and acknowledge whether you're uninsured or not, or to seek um, care at their public health departments or now these new federally run test to treat sites. Um, but this is a challenge and it's one that we're continuing to overcome in light of the shutdown of the uninsured fund. Thank you. Um, I, I've heard also from state health officials about declines in vaccination coverage for routine immunizations such as the measles, mumps, and rubella, um, that vaccine. Uh, so. Uh, Dr. Uh, Walensky, uh, how is the CDC working to ensure that any forthcoming recommendation on the COVID-19 vaccine for kids gives parents the information that they need to feel confident about getting not just this vaccine, but as well as um, all uh, other routine immunizations? And is there an opportunity to um, uh, up the rate of vaccination for these other conditions at the same time as you're vaccinating uh, uh, kids. Yeah, thank you so much, Senator Baldwin. So um, we re recently reported data that demonstrated a decrease of about 1% of all incoming kindergartners are completely vaccinated for all of the recommended vaccines. That's 35,000 children across this country who are no longer up to date on all of their other vaccines, even before COVID. We have a lot of makeup work to do there in addition to what we need to do with COVID. As we roll out our pediatric vaccines our, for um, children between the ages of six months to five years, and in fact, as we continue continue to enforce the um, importance of vaccination for our 5 to 18 year olds, um, we're seeing differences in vaccine confidence and differences in rates in vaccination. Um, we are doing um, a lot of work in terms of vaccine confidence, putting these vaccines in pediatricians' offices, in federally qualified healthcare centers, in pharmacies, places where parents trust where they normally get this information. We're also canvassing and understanding the vaccine confidence around these areas so that we can focus our attention in areas where confidence might be lacking. Um, and we also, importantly, are starting to see really critical data that show that much of this confidence is lacking in areas, um, in rural areas, that we have about two times the vaccination rate in urban areas compared to rural areas of our children. So areas that we really need to, to focus and we're aware of that and, and are doing those activities as well. Thank, Thank you. you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much. I want to thank members of the panel for their public service and for being here today. I just have, in the interest of time, I think everybody's time, I've get, just got one question for Dr. Fauci. Doctor, I want to uh, wish you uh, a speedy recovery as well as congratulate you on the, the naming of the science complex at Holy Cross College in your honor. I wanted to, to ask you a question, though, about our parents. So many parents across the country right now are unsure about whether to get their kids vaccinated. Uptake of the vaccine has been relatively low for kids who are already eligible. I'm told that under 
something like under 30% of children ages 5 to 11 are fully vaccinated. So when the vaccine becomes available for children under 5, we'll need to meet uh, parents where they are and with the information that they need to make informed decisions about that vaccination. So Dr. Fauci, can you expand upon how the administration is working with trusted messengers in our society, whether they're physicians or community leaders or others, to get accurate information about the vaccinations to parents? Uh, thank you for that very important question, Senator Casey. Certainly now that we have the data, which looks very favorable, we really want to get these children vaccinated because we know vaccinations prevent infection, but to a greater extent prevent severe disease. And as you've heard from a number of us, including and particularly Dr. Walensky, that there are more deaths and serious consequences of COVID among children than there are in influenza. The department, HHS, has a very comprehensive rollout plan, which they have been literally preparing for now for several weeks to months in anticipation of if we do and we did get favorable results on the clinical trials from Moderna and from Pfizer, that we would be able to get children and get parents to understand where these vaccines are available in pediatrician offices and pharmacies and clinics. So this is something that the department has taken very seriously and hopefully will do a very high uptake of vaccines because many parents, as we all know, have been waiting some time now to get their children vaccinated. And hopefully the program that HHS is rolling out will facilitate that. Thank you. Doctor, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Senator Kane. Thank you, Senator Hickenlooper, and thanks to our witnesses. I want to echo comments that I know uh, Chair Murray made earlier about the importance of more, law, of more COVID funding uh, in a variety of ways. We, we are thankfully, we're seeing hospitalizations come down dramatically in Virginia. It was about 4,000 a day in January, about 500 a day now. That is very, very positive. And I'm looking at hospitalization and death data a lot more intensely than the case data because I think cases continue to be high but the because transmissibility is high but this um, severity is dropping which is what we would want um, but I do think we still need more funding to deal with COVID issues especially for low-income people and I would also say the US vaccine vaccine diplomacy around the world has been a real positive investment uh, that has both helped our own public health help the health of others around the world, world, but built up goodwill. So I'm strongly for it. Um, I, I do want to just quibble with one thing. Um, Senator Smith asked you all the questions about whether you're equally as effective if you're working virtually or in the office, and you said yes, as effective. I'm going to be honest. There's one area, and it's in the FDA space, Dr. Califf, where it's not as effective, and that's inspections. Um, the AP had a story that was out earlier this week that said during the period largely from March of 2020 till June of 2021, you were not at the FDA then. But during that period, the FDA missed 15,000 inspections that would normally have done. The FDA is racing to catch up, has, has cleared a backlog of about 5,000 of those. But there, there is no substitute for an inspection. There's just no substitute for it. And, um, you know, what, what troubled me about that is the, the folks working at plants that need inspection, like an infant formula plant, they're essentially essential workers. We can't stop producing formula, so they have to be there. If they have to be there to do something that the public needs, then the inspectors should be there too. And I recognize that poses health challenges, um, but, but, and again, you were, you were not at the FDA during this period when the inspections were stopped, but I, I frankly worry a little bit about are there other surprises around the corner for us in these spaces where we weren't doing inspections, and I'm, I'm not even going to ask you about it because I know you take it seriously and you're trying to catch up on the backlog and get back. Can I just it. comment that I uh, agree. I was asked about the office, so if you asked about, definitely, we had uh, inspections that were put on hold, and there's been a price to pay for that. Yeah, I would say an inspector is every bit as essential a worker as the worker that we require to go to the plant to produce medicine, to produce infant formula, et cetera. Um, I want to ask a question that I always ask of Dr. Fauci, and Dr. Fauci, I hope you're, you're feeling well, and I'm glad you're able to join us virtually. Um, I started to share my own experiences with long COVID nerve tingling symptoms 
about a year ago because, A, I was having them, and they, they're exactly the same as they were when I got COVID in March of 20 to 20. But B, I was running into a lot of people who were experiencing more serious symptoms and weren't being believed. And I felt like sharing from this podium that, yeah, no, I believe you, because I'm dealing with nerve tingling that I'd never felt in 62 years might open up a discussion and make people feel like they were being heard. Um, as I expected when I started to talk about this, my office has become a real um, uh, nerve center for people who want to share their experiences with long COVID and ask for help. So what I want to ask you to know, given that we've put in some significant funding for long COVID research, what's the current status of the NIH Recover Project? Yes. Yeah, thank you for that very important question, Senator Canyon. Let me assure you that from the patients that we have seen and the input we've seen from so many people, this is a real syndrome, it's a real problem, and it's something we really need to get to the bottom of. There are two tracks that are going on. One is a broad cohort track, which many people refer to as the Recover Program, where large cohorts of individuals are now being followed in long range to determine the incidence, the prevalence, and hopefully learn about the pathogenesis of this real syndrome. They are now accumulating very large numbers of individuals. One of the problems, Senator, is that there is no yet identifiable pathogenic process. So people ask, why aren't you treating it? What are you doing for it? It's very, very difficult to do that because this is a heterogeneous syndrome as you probably know from the people that now are you know, essentially addressing your own office because of your own personal involvement. But there are other things that are going on simultaneously. For example, there's a pediatric research immune network called PRISM, which is looking at this in children, particularly children that might have the multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children. There's the what we call immunophenotyping to determine is there anything that relates to a hyperactivity or an aberrant triggering of immune response that's triggering some of the things that you might be feeling, including the tingling in your nerves. So there's the broader cohort project and a number of individual projects. I do hope, and I say that sincerely because there are so many people now, when you talk about the tens and tens of millions of people who have COVID in this country, that even a small percentage, and I'm not so sure it's that small, who wind up with varying degrees of long COVID, we have to address this problem, find out the underlying mechanism, and do something about it. Thank you. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much, and I yield back Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you. All right, Senator Rosen. Well, thank you, Chair Hickenlooper. And uh, Dr. Fauci, I know we all hope you're feeling all right. Thank you for being here. And thank you to all of you for your continued uh, presence, your work, and your commitment to um, doing that good work going forward. I want to um, talk about uh, the vaccines and booster shots just a little bit because we know the COVID virus, uh, the COVID-19 virus is going to continue to mutate. It's critical that we use our best defense. We all know this as vaccines to keep our most vulnerable populations safe. They're going to protect lives and livelihoods. And I just want to focus for one second on one of our highly vulnerable populations, our seniors. Many of them may have unique challenges because of their mobility or a variety of other issues. So Dr. Walensky, we know more than 90% of seniors are fully vaccinated. Nearly 70% have received their first booster dose, but only a little over 30% of our seniors have received their recommend, recommended second booster. So what are you doing to, um, I would say, just not just improve outreach, but what about those access barriers that may, uh, we may have with seniors in assisted living or nursing homes, memory care, uh, and, and the like? Yeah, thank you, Senator Rosen. So um, several weeks ago, we increased our um, recommendation, strengthened our recommendation for a second booster shot, and that is in the context of this increased um, number of infections for our elderly. What I will tell you is we have data forthcoming later this week that will demonstrate that that fourth dose, um, compared to the third dose, has decreased the risk of death by sevenfold. So we now have actually data from the United States that has demonstrated the value of this booster dose, especially among the elderly and the most frail. Um, we are. We now have vaccine in, in tens of thousands of sites. We have vaccines in um, pharmacies. We have vaccines in, in providers, uh, provi uh, 
physicians' offices. Um, we have vaccines throughout the country and in our long-term care facilities, and we're continually um, looking at vaccine confidence and canvassing our states to understand where we have challenges in vaccine confidence. One of the areas, as I indicated earlier, for pediatrics, but also true for adults, is um, in our rural urban divide, mm -hmm. that we actually have challenges in reaching our rural communities, um, both for vaccine confidence, but actually to get folks boosted as for their first shot as well as their second. So we're continuing outreach there through media, through social media. Um, I've done media with our collaborations through the US um, DA um, and through Rural Public Health Association. So we are continuing that outreach. Once we can understand where the data are and where the challenges are, we focus on those areas so that we can do more um, in those areas. Well, maybe that's where our mobile health, rural mobile health clinics um, can make a difference. But would you follow up on that um, really for our general population? Um, you said you're the updated guidance is going to come out in a few weeks for access to the second booster dose for general population because we know it keeps people out of the hospital and from suffering um, more severe uh, disease. Um, yeah, so we continue at CDC to follow the data um, with regard to how our vaccines are performing. And um, so far, the data on um, decreases of severe disease, hospitalizations, and death have been limited, um, and the waning has been limited to the elderly population. But we are continuing to follow the data for the younger population to see if and when there is waning in that population as well, and if and when we should bring another booster dose to that population as well. Thank you. I, I want to keep a little bit on seniors because we know that the pandemic has had um, real mental health challenges for, of course, our children, for, for all of us. But I'm going to focus on seniors today because ARP has uh, really noted that it's critical to find a balance between patient health and uh, caregiving, how the absence of caregivers or if the caregivers themselves are vaccinated, um, it really makes a difference. And um, I just would like to know what lessons the CDC has learned uh, from the pandemic about caring for seniors and addressing the social isolation that we felt uh, prior to the vaccine. What can we do there, do you think? Um, we have learned really hard, hard learned lessons, I would say, through the last two and a half years with regard to mental health, not just in our seniors, but across the, the age demographic in our in our students and in our seniors and across the age demographic. We at CDC are doing um, a lot of work um, across the country with the VA, with um, NGOs, with community-based organizations within our tribes to strengthen um, mental health resources, to decrease suicide, to uh, allow children to get back to school, to allow parents and caregivers um, the mental health resources that they need so that they can combat the challenges of mental health right now. Uh, thank you. I know my time's up. I appreciate that going forward. Uh, for the K through 12 population, uh, Senator Murkowski and I introduced bipartisan legislation to bring mental health um, down uh, that was funding for health grants that normally go to universities and colleges, but to bring it down K through 12 because we have seen increased suicide, increased mental health challenges. Nevada at one point, our Clark County School District was the highest of youth suicide, I believe uh, in the year 2020, a list no one wants to top. So uh, um, I look forward to working with all of you and trying to um, do what we can to promote good mental health services and suicide prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Um, and I'm going to take just a moment of privilege. I want to ask one last question to Dr. Walensky, um, just because I don't think uh, the people of America really understand how interconnected we are. I want to just take a moment to, I mean, we've seen from the, cur the current COVID pandemic uh, that viral pathogens don't pay at any attention to national borders. Uh, the reality is, I think it creates real danger for for the probability that new COVID variants or other pathogens like monkeypox uh, that will, can emerge and spread quickly undetected in our interconnected world. Uh, the number I have is 62% of the global population is fully vaccinated against COVID. And clearly there are significant disparities between countries. Many countries just do not have the resources to get to a significant part of their population. The, the more vaccines and thera therapeutics we can distribute around the world, the less chance we give variants to spread. And I think that's the, we don't really have a number on that yet in terms of what is the, how are we increasing the probability of some new variant? How serious is this danger? 
by us allowing these large uh, populations in isolation to almost incubate uh, new pathogens or, or more importantly, new variants. So Dr. Walensky, um, how's the CDC's tracking of viral threats globally changed uh, with the launch of the Center for Forecasting and, and Outbreak Analytics? Uh, and what more do we need to know, do now to address this global reality that we face in terms of public health threats? And again, how do we, I'll, I'll, I'll take responsibility for how we spread the, the, that information to the public, but it's something most people are not aware of. Thank you, Senator Hickenlooper. So, so um, we launched the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analytics. This is a center that um, will be able, is currently able to um, scale up and look at forecasting to inform local jurisdictions as well, well as global jurisdictions to understand where the pathogens are and their risk of coming to us, um, as well as to innovate and to think about new ways that we might be able to forecast and understand pathogens um, headed in our direction. Um, that center has been uh, really helpful in, in understanding the, the importance of new variants. Um, the Omicron variant, they, they have stood up and enforced forecasting and understanding where we need to put our resources at the local level. I do want to take one moment to say, um, I, I think you're exactly right. We know through this pandemic um, that no one is safe until everyone is safe. The disparities that we have in vaccination coverage around this world are likely to potentially lead to new variants. And um, if we don't control um, these new variants, they will likely reach our shores again. I. Um, I'm concerned that with the lack of supplemental funding that we at CDC will not be able to continue our global vaccine efforts that we have in terms of our technical assistance on the ground, our surveillance, our genomic sequencing, um, and our ability to um, do vaccine surveillance and vaccine safety surveillance within um, countries that we support. So thank you very much for, for noting that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Burr. Thanks, Senator Higginlooper. Um, I'm going to wrap up. I guess the chair is not coming back. A um, couple of quick questions. Dr. Lewinsky, um, public health emergency. It expires July 15th. Do you intend to extend that? Uh, I am not the one who would extend it, actually. Thank you, Senator Burr. Um, it, that, that is for the secretary. But you'll make the recommendation, won't you? I think it'll be an all of HHS recommendation. Okay, well, let me just say, we've removed the mask requirements. We've eliminated testing requirements to re-enter the country. Um, Title 42 is a CDC decision, and you said in your response to a letter to me um, that you were lifting it because and I'll, I'll, I'll refer to how you, I think, address Senator Marshall. You said we have, there, you said we have the tools, test, and vaccinations, therefore there's no longer a public health emergency. Yeah, I, I, I misspoke. We had the tools, tests, and vaccinations, therefore there is no longer a public health reason to bar people from entering this country. Thank you. I appreciate your, the opportunity to correct that. But there's a public health emergency still. Um, I, I think the, the um, question of a public health emergency is a different question for then is there a public health reason to bar people from entering into the country? I'd like to make that distinction. Well, I, I, it's already in the record, uh, I think, what you wrote to me, uh, which I think basically said we don't have a public health concern. Um, let me ask you, what are you looking for to end the public health emergency? Um, maybe if I could defer the, that question to the ASPR, that might, uh, I think, as part of the HHS, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Senator Burr. So the Secretary does have this authority, uh, and he did, uh, the Secretary declared it in January 2020, previous Secretary. Um, and it's been extended multiple times. Uh, one of the commitments we've made in this administration is that we're going to give uh, states and local governments 60 days notice before we take it down. Um, in deciding whether to take it down, we're in daily communication with our clinicians, our scientists, the folks on the ground. What the public health emergency unlocks is uh, healthcare system flexibilities. It's something that CMS relies on 
um, significantly. It, it extends Medicaid coverage uh, for folks during times of an emergency. It extends telehealth coverage to those on Medicare. Um, and it allows uh, hospitals and uh, nursing homes and other healthcare facilities some flexibilities in responding um, to the situation at hand. So uh, we continue to be in touch to understand whether these are still necessary. And, uh, th and as uh, Dr. Walensky said, the department will uh, come together and make that decision or recommendation to the secretary uh, for him to decide. But uh, we will give 60 days notice before it comes down. So you, you, you've answered the question that I asked, which will, will it be extended? Yeah, it'll be extended because 60 days from now is past July 15th, right? So no notification has been made to the state, so it will be extended past there. I'll write the secretary and ask him what the criteria is to end the state of the emergency, uh, the public health emergency, excuse me. Uh, I would only point out that the guidance that we currently have going out does not suggest that there is a public health emergency. We're beginning to dismantle everything. I'm not sure it's for any reason other than the fact that everybody around the world's doing it uh, because we are 60 or 90 or 120 days behind them. Now, all of you just told Senator Smith that remote work hasn't hampered your agency's response efforts. Okay, FDA failed to identify a crisis with baby formula. CDC, uh, I think, failed to lead as it relates to monkeypox. Um, Secretary Becerra, at my, when I wrote him and asked him about HHS staffing and were they actually at work when, uh, were they actually working when not at the office, wouldn't provide me anything. Now, none of you seem to know how many people in your complex, and Tony, I leave NIH out of this because of the, the unique nature of the work there. How many of you can tell me how many people aren't at work? Pilot programs, executive declarations. Um, that makes me wonder how you mother, measure whether people are actually working when at home. And then I come today. I always like to bring things back to the present because I have a tremendous amount of respect for all four of you. Some I've dealt with longer than others. Um, I supported where there was public acknowledgement of it. Everybody, Tony outdates me. He was here before I got here 28 years ago. Um, because I believed you had the capacity, the intelligence, the education, and the independence to serve in the role you're in. And for two of you, I asked when you were confirmed, would you provide me with all the questions I ask as the minority ranking member? The answer was yes. Now we come to today. This has been the most well-orchestrated event that I've seen in the 28 years that I've been here. And for most of you, you've been willing participants in it. Um, this was designed to pressure Republicans to open a checkbook, sign the check, and let the administration fill in the balance with no detail on how, when, for what, um, that was being asked for. I've never in 28 years seen an attempt to get an outcome without answering questions. I leave today extremely disappointed that maybe my judgment's been flogged. But I will say this to each and every one of you. Um, nobody's worked harder on this issue, I think, on the Hill than I have. Nobody's gone to bat for emergency money with no strings attached than I have. But there is a point in time where my patience runs out, where the requirement I have for my constituents in North Carolina, my colleagues in the minority, which are 50, exactly what's in the majority, requires a degree of detail 
that you and this administration are not willing to share. Uh, I personally believe that if the federal government doesn't lead by forcing employees back to work, and Rob, Google's a hell of a lot different than the FDA. Google can pull it off. Um, but the federal government has to set the example for the rest of the country that it's time to leave your house. I hate to see what the health, what the health care cost is going to be to our country for mental health now on the adult side. Husbands and wives aren't used to spending all day together. Just like kids need the interaction of school. Um, folks, let's get back to running your agencies. Let's bring the employees back into the office. Let's answer the questions that every member of Congress has for you and not just the ones the administration wants to do. You serve in a uniquely special capacity. And when you address public health, it's not for some, it is for all. And I hope you will look at this dais and these members and realize there is no difference between one that sits on this side or that side they're on this committee because they are passionate about the issues that we take up. I thank the chair for his indulgence. I thank the witnesses for their expertise and their willingness to be here today. Uh, I yield back. Thank you, Senator Burr. Uh, I echo his appreciation for all of your hard work. Uh, realize that science, and especially medical science, is, is some of the most daunting, presents some of the most daunting challenges that we face. I remember when I was a, in small business, the times that caused me greatest anxiety and, and serious mental, mental health challenges was when, when I didn't have enough information to make important decisions that were going to affect the lives of my employees or, or sometimes even my customers, that, that that challenge of having to deal with the facts we have and not the facts that we would like, having to make decisions that affect people's, well, their lives, is, is some of the hardest decisions you can make when you don't have all, when science doesn't give you all the answers or enough information to know that you've got the answer. And yet you've all stood up and continued your work and dealt with these evolving situations. So I am very grateful, uh, I'd like to thank all the, my colleagues on the Senate side of this, but also all of our witnesses, witnesses Dr. Walensky, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Califf, Assistant Secretary O'Connell. Um, this is an important conversation. I hope after this discussion it is clear how critical it is that we pass emergency funding uh, and make sure that we can protect our communities from what this pandemic throws next, which, again, we can't, we can't be certain of. Uh, for any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, uh, July 1st at 5 p.m. This committee stands adjourned.